In accordance with Section 16 of the Powers, Privileges and, and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislature Act 2004, as a witness to this oversight inquiry, please be informed that by law you are required to answer fully and satisfactorily all the questions lawfully put to you or to produce any document that you are required to produce in connection with the subject matter of the inquiry notwithstanding the fact that the answer or the document could incriminate you or expose you to criminal or civil proceedings or damages. You are, however, protected in that evidence given under oath or affirmation before a house or a committee may not be used against you in any court or place outside parliament, except in criminal proceedings concerning a charge of perjury or a charge relating to the evidence or documents required in these proceedings. Please be aware that in terms of Section 17.2 of the Powers, Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislature Act, a person who willfully furnishes a house or committee with information or makes a statement before it which is false or misleading commits an offence and is liable to a fine or to imprisonment for a period of not exceeding two years. You are required to take an oath or affirm the evidence you are about to give is truthful. You may choose to take the oath or the affirmation. Which do you prefer? Um, the affirmation. I solemnly affirm that the evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, Advocate Vanara, it's your turn. You may lead us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Mr. Molife, can you... Oh, sorry. Thanks, Chair. I was just waiting f on uh, Mr. Malifa to just finish uh, signing the uh, affirmation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Malifa, sir, can you, for the record, uh, state your full names? Brian Malifa. Is it correct that uh, you have prepared a statement, uh, it's a 20 page statement? Uh, dated uh, the 21st uh, November 2017. It is indeed correct. And that you have furnished the committee with annexures to your statement? Yes, it is correct. With your permission, the statement has been uh, furnished to the members of the committee, and subsequently, because these proceedings are open, it will be furnished to members of the public. Have any difficulty with that? I do not have a difficulty with that, uh, Chairperson, but I would like to read the statement. In all fairness, if you want to read the statement, please do so, sir. Thank you, sir. I arrived at ESCOM in April 2015. During this period, ESCOM was experiencing load shedding, which was having a debilitating effect on the South African economy as well as on ESCOM. Evidence to this is on page 21 and 22 of the annexures. The staff morale was very low. The South African public was generally angry with the utility because of the hardship that load shedding was imposing on them. The fastest growing app in social media was called ESCOM's a push. This for me summarized the extent of public anger and frustration at load shedding, which was generally seen as ESCOM's fault. I saw my first task as being to instill a fresh sense of purpose and improve the morale of all staff, including senior management. 
We embarked on a program to improve the maintenance of ESCOM's fleet of electricity generating plants. This led to the development of the strategy called Tetris by some of ESCOM's young engineers, which we have briefed this committee about during previous meetings. My view is that this strategy, as well as the implementation thereof by ESCOM employees, contributed immensely to the, to the end of load shedding, which stopped in August 2015. In this respect, Lyle Team, a young engineer at ESCOM, his team, all the power station managers and the generation team deserve special mention. The Glencore contract. Glencore was, during this period, one of ESCOM's coal suppliers. Their optimum mine had a 25-year contract to supply coal to ESCOM's Henrina power station. This contract is due to expire in 2018. A copy of the contract can be obtained from ESCOM. In terms of this contract, Optimum was obliged to supply coal of a certain quality to ESCOM at 150 rand per ton until 2018. So there was a contractual obligation to supply coal at 150 rand per ton until 2018. The contract also specified that should the coal quality be below certain specified levels, ESCOM could impose a fine on Optimum. A penalty in terms of this contract had previously been imposed by ESCOM in 2012. But there had been on and off negotiations with Glencore on the penalty for about three years. By 2015, when I arrived at ESCOM, I was advised that if we do not take steps to recover the debt, the amount owing on the penalty could prescribe. In May 2015, I became aware of Glencore's request to increase the contracted price to 530 per ton, from 150 to 530 rand per ton. This was, in essence, a request for a variation of the contracted price in favor of Optimum and its shareholder, Glencore. In addition, they wanted the penalties that had already accumulated in terms of this contract, about 2.1 billion rand, to be waived and set aside by ESCOM. Their reason for wanting these variations was hardship. This request, when I arrived at ESCOM, was being favorably considered by ESCOM. However, when I looked at the request, I could not support it. Glencore's hardship was nowhere near ESCOM and South Africa's hardship as a result of load shedding. I could find no reason to entertain this request as we had legally binding agreements on the price of coal as well as the penalties. For ESCOM to have agreed to this request would have been irresponsible in the light of what the company was going through. We met with representatives of Glencore and made it abundantly clear that their request could not be entertained because ESCOM's own position was precarious. I note that during this inquiry, Piers Marsden, who became the business rescue manager of Optimum, characterized our stance in response to Glencore at the time as being commercially sound. I couldn't agree more. Glencore's position was that if they did not get the price increase, they would stop the supply of coal to Henrina, and they emphasized that this could result in more load shedding. In fact, it was during a meeting with Mr. Ivan Leisenberg uh, when um, he told me that uh, they would stop the supply of coal and this would result in more load shedding. And I said to him, if you're putting a gun to my head, sir, please shoot. After the possibility of termination of supply was mentioned by Glencore, 
we started working on increasing the coal stockpiles at Henrina. I knew that ESCOM and the country could not be held to ransom by a supplier of coal who was prepared to let South Africa suffer crippling power shortages to secure an increased price. The additional cost to ESCOM of such an increase would have been in the region of 1.98 billion rand per annum. So if you take the increase over the remaining three years of the contract, which was from 2015 to 2018, it would have in fact come to just under 6 billion rand additional to what ESCOM was under no obligation to pay, but that was being requested by Glencore. Minister Ramatlodi and Glencore. <clears throat> At about this time, the Department of Minerals announced that Glencore's mining licenses have been suspended. Uh, if you look at the annex, just pages, pages 24 to 25, which was the announcement of the uh, Glencore's, uh, suspension of Glencore's mining licenses by the Department of Minerals. The reason for the suspension was that Glencore had not followed due process in the proposed retrenchments of their workers. The effect of the suspension of the mining licenses would have been to guarantee the suspension of coal supplies by optimum to Henrina. In fact, for the period when the licenses were suspended, there was no supply of coal by optimum to Henrina Power Station. We were relieved when a few days later, the suspension of the licenses was withdrawn. I was dumbfounded when in May 2017, former Minister Ramatlodi claimed that the ESCOM chairman, Dr. Ngubani, and I met with him to ask him to suspend Glencore's license, <clears throat> and that he refused because it would result in more load shedding. He seemed to have forgotten that he had in fact suspended the license at the time, and in fact we had requested him not to suspend the license because it would result in more load shedding and it would result in meeting Glencore's desire not to supply coal to Henrina at 150. Business rescue. In early August 2015, Glencore decided to put Optimum in business rescue. <laughs> A business rescue practitioner, Pierce Marsden, was appointed. Within 48 hours of being appointed, the practitioner wrote to ESCOM saying that he requires us to increase the price that we were paying for optimum coal. Otherwise, he will have to stop the supply of coal to Henrina, which would result in more load shedding. The supply of coal to Henrina was indeed suspended by the business rescue practitioner in August. He admitted to doing this when he gave evidence here. For about a month, we had no coal from Optimum and we supplied Henrina from the stockpiles as well as through scavenging from the small coal miners in the area. Despite not having the coal from Henrina, we never closed down the power station. <clears throat> the month of August also happened to be the month in which Tetris started showing results. Plant availability improved sufficiently to stop load shedding. However, if Henrina had been closed because there was no coal, load shedding would have continued. Load shedding stopped in spite of the fact that Optimum was not supplying us with coal. In his evidence in this inquiry, Piers Marsden confirmed that they used the business rescue rules to avoid entering into arbitration proceedings with ESCOM on the 2.1 billion rand penalty. He also said that ESCOM did try to take the matter, the, to, to take the matter of the 2.1 billion penalty on arbitration, but they resisted it. In September 2015, Mr. Clinton Efron of Glencore, and not the business rescue practitioner, called me to say 
that they would resume coal supplies to Henrina at 150 rand per ton, which we accepted. Subsequently, Glencore intimated that they would like to sell Optima. We told them that that was their decision, but that they must know that our price of 150 per ton stands until 2018, irrespective of who the owner of the mine is. Similarly, the penalty of 2.1 billion would remain, would remain payable. This was confirmed also by Piers Musden at this inquiry, and even went on to further to say that he thinks that Pembani could not meet these conditions, and that is why they didn't do the deal. He said that in his uh, evidence here. The sale of Optimum. Glencoe, after entertaining several buyers, sold Optimum to Oak Bay. The deal was approved by all the creditors of Optimum, mainly South African banks, as well as the Competition Commission. At the time of the sale, the price of coal to, for Henrina remained 150 rand per ton, in line with the agreement, and the 2.1 billion penalties remained payable by the new sellers. Pembani had also indicated their interest in buying the mine. When we indicated that the 150 rand per ton as well as the penalties will remain payable, their view was that the deal was not attractive. They walked away. Incidentally, Piers Marsden also confirms in, in his testimony to this, this in his testimony to this committee. The pension payment from Escon Pension Fund. I don't know if I should deal with, we should deal with uh, Optimum and then go to the pension payment or do everything and then take questions later. Yeah, I think uh, just finish your presentation. <coughs> okay, Paul, the pension that. payment from ESCOM Pension Fund. In April 2015, I was seconded from Transnet to ESCOM as Group Chief Executive Officer in an acting capacity. On the 2nd of October 2015, I received a letter from the Minister of Public Enterprises appointing me as Chief Executive Officer of ESCOM and ex-officio member of the ESCOM board. The letter did not have a limitation on the period of employment. The letter is attached, page 29 to 30, of uh, the, of the uh, in, uh, uh, annexures. Also in October <clears throat> 2015, I also received a letter from the chairman of ESCOM, Dr. Ben Gubani confirming my appointment as Group Chief Executive Officer. There was no limitation on the period of employment. The letter is on page 31 to 34. Unfortunately, Chair, the letter that was given to me had been signed, and I signed it and returned it to ESCOM. Unfortunately, I did not keep a signed copy, but in my records I found a copy of the letter before it was signed by the Chairman and myself. Also, in early October 2015, I received and signed the executive employment contract that is attached in page 35 to 49 from ESCOM, which specified the commencement date of my employment as the 1st of October 2015, and the contract specified that employment was to continue for an indefinite period, clause 3.1, of the contract, which is on page 39 of the documents. In November 2015, my membership of the ESCOM Pension Fund was finalized. I also transferred proceeds from my Transnet Pension Fund to the ESCOM Pension Fund, which was about 4.3 million rand. The ESCOM Pension Fund loaded my membership in their system as PPX, meaning that I was a permanent employee. On the 1st of November 2015, the minister wrote a letter to Dr. Ngubani informing him of a cabinet decision to employ all the parastatal executives. Uh, this is a, a, an edit that I would like to, I, I just said the, all the parastatal executives, but uh, it's parastatal executive directors, which is uh, the, the parastatal executive directors, which is ESCOM's executive directors on five-year contracts. 
This meant that my contract of employment would be changed from a permanent contract to a five-year contract. And that is on page 50. The, the minister's letter is attached on page 50 of the documents. On the 9th of November 2015, I received a letter from Dr. Ngubani advising me that I will be required to enter into a fixed-term contract of employment, which is page 52 to 54. I note that when Ms. Daniels was giving evidence here, my employment contract documents for her start with this letter and not with the letter of the minister of the 2nd of October, which is a very, very big omission in my opinion. On the, 20, uh, the pension fund as well was uh, misled by this letter of the 9th of November, which simply forgot that I had already been employed on the 2nd of October by the minister on an open on the ended contract, and I was a member, therefore, of the pension fund. On the 25th of November 2015, Dr. Ngubani wrote a letter to Minister Brown. And this letter I have attached on page 55 and 56. In that letter, he requested that at the end of the five-year contract, I be allowed to, require, to retire from service as if I'm 63 years old. Penalties prescribed by the EPPF be waived and ESCOM would carry the cost of the penalties. The letter of 25 November 2015 from Dr. Ngubani, which by the way had been written because I had asked members of the board and the PNG, when you change my contract from a permanent employment contract to a five-year contract, what will happen to my pension? I asked that question. Because I had just come back from a four-year stint at Transnet. My contract of employment at Transnet had actually been renewed for a further five years, which means that I would finish 10 years at Transnet. But now I was sent to ESCOM. I was requested to go and assist at ESCOM because of load shedding. And uh, so I asked, what will happen to my pension? And then there was a presentation by the specialist at ESCOM to the board and the, uh, the uh, PNG to say that we will recommend that when you leave, we pay your additional pension to make up for your agreeing to change your contract from permanent to five years. That is what happened, sir. Sorry, Chairperson. The letter of the 25th of November 2015, which specified these new pension arrangements, was sent by the ESCOM company secretary, Ms. Suzanne Daniels, to Ms. Kim Davids, the minister's PA, Osila Rathman, and Z Mbilasi at the Department of Public Enterprises. The letter was emailed at 20 hours 33 on the 25th of November 2015 by Ms. Daniels. And the proof of that is on page 57 of the documents. At 21.05 on the 25th of November 2015, Ms. K. Davids acknowledged receipt of the letter and undertook to bring the letter to the minister's attention. And this uh, acknowledgement is on page 57 of these documents. On the 26th of November 2015, Kim Shongo sent an email to Ms. S. Daniels confirming that the letter will be brought to the minister's attention, and that is on page 59. Also, Osila Radman noted the letter, and her email is on page 60 of these documents. On the 9th of February 2016, the People and Governance Subcommittee of the ESCOM Board, PNG, received a presentation from Mr. A. Minar. Now, please note, sir, uh, from Chairperson, that by this time, the letter about my pension arrangements had been with the department since November, and there had been no response. There's a section in the PFMA, I think it's uh, section 54, which says if the executive authority does not respond within 30 days, approval has been granted. So, I don't know, I think 
I cannot speak for the PNG or the board, but maybe they labored under the presumption that they have given the minister this information. And in fact, that letter requested approval for my pension arrangements, but there had not been a response from the department. So the People and Governance Subcommittee of, of ESCOM received a presentation from Mr. Anton Minar on the 9th of February, 2016, where he reported that a five-year contract, the, 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 the presentation and the minutes of the meeting of that date are attached as page 62 of the documents. He reported that the five-year contract for the group chief executive of ESCOM is a of ESCOM is a first for ESCOM. And I think Ms. Veneta Tlain was at pains to say that that threw them in a spin uh, uh, during testimony this morning. He also referred to previous precedents at ESCOM where additional pensionable service was granted to executives and penalties were waived. Incidentally, uh, when the EPPF was here, they also confirmed that this had been done before. And uh, Mr. Brian Dames, in his evidence here, also said, my last request as he was leaving ESCOM was, just like the other previous chief executives had received uh, the patches of their years and so on, he also requested it. I don't know if it was granted, but he did say in his evidence that he also made that request. Incidentally, it would be interesting to see how far back this practice goes and which chief executives were paid in this manner or had their pensions arrangements in this manner. During the, uh, the, the court hearings that are now going to the High Court next week, uh, during the process, we have requested through Section 35 of the rules of the court uh, from ESCOM and the pension fund information about who else uh, received this kind of arrangement. And both ESCOM and uh, the pension fund refused to tell us or to put it on record at court that these are the chief executives who received these similar benefits when they left. So perhaps this committee can shed more light on that issue by the time uh, uh, the, the inquiry is finished as to which chief executives and how far back does it go that uh, similar arrangements were made. By the way, because the pension fund is a defined benefit fund, the benefits are defined. So. Uh, um, it is, uh, one has to, the, the, the contributions are really not an issue, but it's the benefits that, uh, that are defined by a defined benefit fund. During this meeting, the PNG made a resolution, which is attached on page 63, that the ESCOM uh, the resolution I've attached on page 63 of the documents, the ESCOM pension fund rules that employees may proceed on retirement from age 50 with 10 years service remains applicable. This was the resolution of the EPPF. And it also said, where executive directors, not specifically the group chief executive of ESCOM, but where executive directors on fixed term contracts, take early retirement, and there is a shortfall regarding 10 years, the 10 years, ESCOM will bridge the gap, waive penalties, and refund EPPF cost. This resolution was taken by the, by the, uh, at the meeting of the PNG. I note that Mr. Brian Dames testified recently before this committee that there was a practice at ESCOM to permit executives to take early retirement from ESCOM. Mr. Sivusi Solutuli, principal officer of the EPPF, said that pension fund rule 28 permitted normal retirement from the fund 
at age 50 with the permission of the employer. Uh, if I can read you that uh, part of the rule, the rule. On, on page 80 of the uh, sorry page 84 section 28.3 says that uh, <laughs> no it's on the uh, page 80 of the ignore yes. ignore ignore that they must talk to direct they must direct the accuracy to me so okay. that you don't get distracted. Page 84 of the, of the, uh, uh, the documents that I have submitted. Uh, subsection 3 says, with effect from 4 March 2000, if a member who has attained the age of 50 years or who had attained the age of 45 years and who is listed in Appendix 10 of the rules and has not less than 10 years pensionable service becomes entitled to a benefit in terms of this rule, he may instead be granted at the discretion of the board after consulting the employer as from the date of his leaving the service of his employer, a pension in respect of his pensionable service calculated in terms of Rule 22, with 22 without reduction in terms of Rule 24. This is the, the rule that actually that uh, led to a lot of confusion because in fact if you go back to just before you get to section 28, it actually talks about retrenchments. So the, this rule is interpreted in fact to mean that it would only apply in the case of retrenchments. However, when you go to the members' guidelines, the members' guidelines simply took that rule and put it in the guidelines as if it is permissible for a member who is over 50 years old and who has the permission of the employer to go on early retirement. And the member's guidelines under section uh, 3.3, page 68 of the document, says a member between the ages of 50 and 63 may go on early retirement without penalty and without potential service without potential service by mutual agreement with the employer where the employer will pay for the cost of early retirement. That is the penalty. Members between the ages of 50 and 55 need to have contributed to the fund for a minimum of 10 years in order to qualify for this benefit. Which means that if the employer agreed, the employer could also pay in the 10 years. Which is in fact what happened. That as compared in the 10 years in terms of the guidelines. But later on we discovered that this was in fact not so. Strictly speaking in terms of, we even disagreed with the pension fund. We had made a mistake. We could not apply this rule in my case and that is the subject of the court case. The guide informed my understanding of the EPPF rules and was, and was referred to by Mr. Minar in the PNG subcommittee referred, about, referred to above. On the 11th of November 2015, I wrote a letter to Dr. Ngubani requesting early retirement in terms of the rules of the EPPF and the re resolution of the PNG meeting of the own 9th of February 2016. Chairperson, you'll notice that I wrote a letter requesting early retirement. I did not write a letter that says, I hereby resign. I wrote a letter requesting early retirement. That letter that I wrote on the 11th of November 2015 is attached as uh, on page 85 of the documents, the actual letter that I wrote. On the 24th of November 2016, I received a letter from Dr. Ngubani communicating the ESCOM board's acceptance of my early retirement. That is attached on page 86. On the 18th of February, 2017, 
I received a letter from the ESCOM Pension Fund welcoming me as a pensioner and providing details of my pension, which is attached on page 88. In fact, if you read that letter, you will see that I did not receive 30 million rand. So I did not receive 30.1 million rand as has been widely reported. I receive a lump sum of some 7.7 .7 million from the EPPF on being admitted to the fund. Of this, 4.3 million had been transferred by me from the Transnet Pension Fund to the EPPF when I joined the EPPF. In April 2015, after I had accepted appointment as a member of the National Assembly by the Northwest Province of the ANC, members of the ESCOM board and company secretary met with me and intimated that the acceptance of my early retirement application was a mistake. I asked them to make a proposal on a way forward that would get the Minister of Public Enterprises approval. On the 11th of May 2017, I received a letter from Dr. Ngubani requesting me to resume duties as ESCOM Group Chief Executive. That letter is attached, page 90 to 91 of the documents. Because of the common error of implementing the early retirement, the legal position was that the situation had to be restored to status quo ante. I obtained legal advice who co and which confirmed that that was indeed the legal position. I signed a reinstatement agreement, which is on page 92. The reinstatement agreement did not seek to reinstate me. The fact that my pension arrangements or my pension agreement was void up in issue means that my contract of employment was still in existence and that is what the legal advice that we obtained. And so the reinstatement agreement just uh, uh, regulated the manner in which I would return to ESCOM on the date that had been specified by the chairman of the board. ESCOM also assured me that the minister was comfortable and had approved this arrangement um, of the rectifying of the common mistake. Ms. Daniels, in her testimony to this committee, indicated that such approval from the minister had been obtained, page 90 to 91 of the, of the documents that I have attached. On the 15th of May 2017, I resumed duties as ESCOM Group Chief Executive in terms of my earlier contract of employment. On the 17th of May 2017, the ESCOM Group Company Secretary wrote a letter to the Principal Officer of the ESCOM Pension Fund advising him of my resumption of duties at ESCOM with effect from the 15th of May 2017 and further advising that my membership of the Pension Fund must be reinstated. That letter is attached, it's page 96 of the documents. On the 15th of May 2015, the Democratic Alliance launched, launched an urgent High Court application to challenge my resumption of duties. This was followed by an application uh, uh, by the EFF. The matter was originally set down to be heard on the 2nd of June 2017. I have submitted all the documents, all the affidavits, all the court records relating to this matter of the DA and the EFF, as well as which was later joined by Solidarity. All the documents have been submitted were in the suitcase that I brought with me. On the 31st of May 2017, Minister Brown sent a letter to Dr. Ngobane instructing the board to rescind the decision to reinstate me as Group Chief Executive. An interesting thing about this decision to rescind the decision to reinstate me was that 
in that agreement that regulated how I would come back, I had agreed that because of the common mistake, the money that is due to the pension fund must be paid back, and I agreed to pay the money back by November this year. But now the, 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 the agreement has been unilaterally rescinded, and so I don't know where the issue of the paying back of the pension money uh, is, because I had agreed that, okay, the mistake was made, uh, I would resume duties and I would pay back what had been paid by the pension fund, which was not 30 million, by the way. It was the uh, 7 million, which included the 4 million that I had contributed, as well as uh, pension payments for the month of January, February, March, and I think April. And uh, this whole matter of how much I owe the pension fund and what the way forward is will now be determined in the High Court. We're going there next week on the 29th to the 1st, and uh, I presume that after that we will go back to the Labor Court. On the 24th of May 2017, Solidarity launched an urgent High Court application seeking to review various decisions concerning my resumption of duties and related relief. On the 2nd of June 2017, after a brief ESCOM board meeting, I received a letter from Dr. Ngubani advising me of the minister's instruction to rescind the reinstatement. This letter is attached as uh, page 99 of the documents. On the 5th of June 2017, I launched a labor court application to set the summary dismissal aside. On the 6th of June 2017, the high court application was postponed pending the outcome of, my labor, of, of the labor court application by the DA and the EFF. On the 4th of July 2017, the labor court issued an order postponing hearing my application until after judgment in the high court applications brought by the DA and the EFF had been finalized. This was a very interesting judgment because I had been an applicant in the labor court matter, but the judge referred me to a matter in which I was a respondent and said that matter must be finalized first before she would hear me. Uh, it, it was very surprising, but nevertheless, we then went back to the high court and the high court will hear the applications from the 29th to the 1st of December 2012. The Public Protector's Report. The Public Protector released a report titled State of Capture Report dated 14th October 2016. The report contained a series of, of, of observations and did not make any findings. Paragraph 5.96 to 5. 101 deal with my phone records and makes some notes. I have repeatedly heard, I think, Mr. Swart in this uh, in this uh, in these proceedings talking about findings. Although the public protector makes the notes, she did not ask me for my side of the story as regards the phone calls nor did she bring the phone records in her possession to my attention before she finalized the report. The, an important principle of our Constitution is the right to be heard. This was denied to me by the public protector. She did not hear me at all on the matter of the phone calls. Secondly, the Public Protectors Act requires her to inform whoever may be implicated by the evidence that she has of the evidence and to ask them for their side of the report. She did not do so, and uh, therefore I have not had an opportunity to ask her uh, or to talk to her about those phone records. Significantly, however, the public protector's report did not make any findings as regards her notes or observations relating to my phone records. And we have toed and froed, and I think Ms. Um, Klein referred to this earlier in her testimony and said that because there were no findings, we could not ask for a review. 
There were no findings about my phone records. And so the questions that the lawyers asked was, but when you ask for a review, what are you asking to be reviewed? Just a note or an observation <coughs> by the public protector, which does not carry, uh, I was told, any weight at all until it is converted into a finding. In fact, in the public protector's report, uh, Advocate Madonsela said, these matters need to be investigated further. And we were hoping that the, the public protector would continue with the investigation. But perhaps her feeling was that the public protector's office was coming to an end with her term. Nevertheless, paragraphs 5.97 refers to contact between myself and Mr. A.J. Gupta on a number of occasions. The public protector fails to provide any other details about the phone calls. She does not provide the phone numbers, nor the dates and times when the phone calls were made. It is therefore difficult for me to determine the veracity of her claim in paragraph 5.97 of the report. Similarly, paragraph 5.98, there are no details of the phone numbers or the dates and times of the phone calls. I can therefore not confirm or deny the veracity of the claims. In paragraph 5.100, the public protector says I can be placed in the section world area 19 times. This, that is all that is said. She does not provide context or even suggest what I may have been doing there. What I understand from inquiries made to a communication expert is that any user of a cell phone within the area of a coverage of a cell phone tower, for example, Linwood, will be recorded as being in the area of, say, Linwood. This includes a user who is in transit through the coverage area of that tower. But more importantly, paragraph 5.99. I don't know if, uh, Madam Chair, you have uh, the public protector's report. Uh, paragraph 5.99, if you go to it, it's a graph that shows, that shows the the number of times that I was in the Saxon world area. You will need a uh, magnifying glass to read that because I struggled with that graph for many months until I could understand it. But entry number one to number 10, which is 10 visits to the Saxon world area, happened in a period of 20 minutes. If you get a magnifying glass, I have one. I, I carry one with me just to read this report whenever I can. I don't know where it is now. What other one have you? The magnifying glass. Yes, Mr. Eberhard. The prof. The, the public protector says I was there. So the uh, 599 suggests the number of instances that I was perpetually in the sexual world area only shows that I was there five times and not 19 times. On the 5th of August, when according to the cell phone service provider's records, I was in the area between 09 hours 17 and 09 hours 41 and made one phone call and received nine others. Incidentally, when I viewed my records, about four minutes before and about five minutes after I, was, I had made the last and the first phone call, I was in fact outside of Saxon World, which means I did not stop for a meeting. For 20 minutes, I received uh, nine phone calls and made one phone call, and the public protector reported that I had been to Saxon World 10 times. The 17th of August, when according to cell phone service providers' records, I made two phone calls while I, was in the trans while I was in transit in the area. The 18th of August, when according to cell phone service providers' records, I made one phone call while I was in transit in the area. 23rd of August, when according to cell phone service rep providers' records, I listened to my voice messages while in transit in the area. And on the 28th of August, when According to cell phone service provider's records, I received two calls, listened to my voice messages, and received one call while in transit in the area. Paragraph 5.101 says that I had contact with Mr. Atul Gupta 
This is not true. Because the phone call from Mr. Atul Gupta to myself was forwarded to my message box. There is no other record in my phone records that shows that I returned Mr. Atul Gupta's call or that he ever tried to contact me again. The public protector recorded it as contact with Mr. Atul Gupta. This is according to my cellular phone records, which I have thoroughly examined since the release of a report. I would have raised these and other discrepancies had Ms. Madonsela afforded me an opportunity to present my side of the story or to get clarification from her. Thank you, Chair. Over to you, Advocate. Are you done, Mr. Malife? Yes, I am done, sir. Okay. If you want to finish uh, the conversation between yourself and your counsel, you can do that uh, because I'm not going to allow the interaction once we start interacting. If there's anything that you want to sort out, you can finalize now. Uh, by saying you will not allow interaction, does it mean I cannot confer with him when I'm asked a question? Unless, of course, it is a matter of a legal nature, but you can't, uh, on a factual issue, confer with counsel. If you insist, clarified? If you insist, sir. No, no, no. You've had a discussion or a conferral with counsel. Has this issue been clarified? Yes, I hear what you're saying. Let's start with, firstly, I want to, to thank you. I think it's, it's um, a point to, to make from myself that uh, when the committee invited you, you didn't get sick, you didn't proffer any resistance to come to the committee. And you furnished us with a statement that you've gone through with annexures. I think that's helpful for the committee, and I personally am grateful for that. I note, I might have missed it in your statement, and please help me understand. It's a very detailed statement with detailed annexures. But I missed uh, your exiting media statement. Is it in the document that uh, you've included in your statement? Not that you were obliged. No, I did not include it because the exiting media statement was not the formal document by which I exited ESCOM. The formal document by which I left ESCOM uh, to go on retirement was the letter that I wrote to Dr. Ngubani. So the media statement was something that I, that I wrote, and, uh, but it, it, did not, it is not a statement that I think would go to my personnel file at ESCOM. Uh, what would have gone to my personnel file and um, my, the treatment of my retirement would be treated in line with the formal letter that I wrote to the board when I was exiting ESCOM. So I did not think, although it is something that I did, uh, I did not think that it was relevant to the, form the formalities of my uh, exiting. When you left Transnet, what was the form of you exiting Transnet? Was it by resignation or was it by early retirement? I resigned. So, you went to Transnet, having made a decision that uh, you'd secured employment somewhere, you're leaving ESCOM. Ah, sorry, Transnet. Yes, having been persuaded. 
and that it was your unilateral decision. You did not need permission from Transnet to grant you uh, permission to leave Transnet. No, I did not. The reason for that, uh, you are correct, is because resignation is in a unilateral act by an employee. In other words, you do not need the employer to give you permission to leave. You can confer with counsel on that legal submission. Uh, yes, it is, uh, I'm advised that it is unilateral to the extent that it becomes accepted. Um, so, um, But you made a decision, you communicated it to ESCOM, sorry, to Transnet, and you went away to ESCOM. The early retirement is different from the resignation because you need to source consent from the employer. Your leaving is not only at your discretion. Is that your understanding? Yes, yes, that is correct. And that is why you would then have addressed a letter to ESCOM asking for permission to retire early. Yes. But let's go back to your press or media statement. I don't know what they call them. I'm not a media person. But I do have it here. I don't know if you still recall it. Yes, I, I, I have it. I recall it. Do you want me to give it to you to read for the record? No, that is not necessary. Let me read it then for the record. Yes, sir. It is dated the 11th of November, 2016. And it says on Wednesday, 2 November, 2016, a report entitled State of Capture prepared by the former public protector, Advocate Tulima Doncella, was released. The report did not make any findings. Instead, it made what were termed observations. Based, the report acknowledged on an investigation not completed. It deferred a proper investigation to a commission of inquiry to be established at a future date. The, outgo the outgoing public protector has directed the president in whom the Constitution vests the power to appoint commissions of inquiry, to appoint one, and further directed the Chief Justice to designate a particular judge to head it. It is a matter for regret that the report was prepared in haste to meet a deadline related to the public protector's own departure from office. That office continues, as all state offices do, and that any uncompleted function is completed by a successor in that office was not a consideration in the report. In an inverted commas, observations made in the report relating to entirely my conduct are in material respects inaccurate, based on part facts or simply unfounded. What the previous public protector has done is not a self to investigate to completion or to allow her office to complete what she initiated too late to complete herself. She has also determined on recording quote unquote observations without in crucial respects putting intended harmful disclosures to me first as she was by law required to do so. 
She has effectively deferred my constitutional right to be heard to a future date and to a further body, which she has ordered others to assemble. If such a body is indeed by law to be assembled and carry out the task, it will not be far, it will be not, it will not be for some time as recent experience indicates. In the meanwhile, harm is done to the institution. It has been my honor to lead in the most difficult times to its reputation to my own. I say nothing of the harm to, to others close to me. I am confident that when the time comes, I will be able to show that I have done nothing wrong that my name will be cleared. I shall dictate myself to showing that an injustice has been done by the presicate delivery of observations in inverted commas following an incomplete investigation, which the former public protector has drawn back from calling in inverted commas findings. The truth will, I uh, thought you say, the truth will come out. That's what, what you want to I have in the interest of good corporate governance decided to leave my employ at ESCOM from 1 January 2017. I do so voluntarily. Indeed, I wish to pay tribute to the unfolding support I have had since I took office from the chairman, the board, and with those with whom it has been my privilege to work. Together we brought ESCOM from the brink. I will take time off to reflect before I decide on my next career move. I wish to reiterate that this act is not an admission of wrongdoing on my part. It is rather what I feel to be the correct thing to do so in the interest of the company and good corporate governance. I wish to thank the shareholder representative, Ms. Lynn Brown, the board, the executive team, and all ESCOM employees for their hard work and guidance in steering the company out of the very difficult times during the 20 months that I was privileged to be a group chief executive. I go now because it is in the interest of ESCO. It is in the interest of ESCO. The public it serves that I do so. Bright Malife, dated 11 November 2016. Anything said in this statement that is attributed to yourself, do you associate yourself with it? I associate myself entirely with that statement. The reading of this statement makes it clear that you are just want to, to go back to the relevant paragraph. You say you leave, you've decided to leave your employee at ESCO. That sounds a unilateral decision. Would you agree? Mr. Vanara, I don't know if you are trying to say that that statement was a letter of resignation. And um, if I had not done anything but write that statement if my employment at ESCOM would have terminated. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe this is a matter that will be determined by the court next week. But if I had written a statement like that and put it in the public domain, uh, I don't know if that would jolt the ESCOM HR department and the EPPF to suddenly start paying my resignation benefits because of that public statement. 
we, 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 we're coming to the pension, not so fast. No, I wasn't talking about the pension. I, wasn't to, I was just saying, I don't know if you are trying to say that that was a resignation letter. You, you have uh, eloquently articulated the point that uh, this issue is a source of a legal dispute. Indeed. And we're trying to get ourselves out of the mist. And that's why we need to look at all the relevant documents to assist us understand what you would have meant in your media statement. And it forms part and parcel of assisting us because your minister that you thank in your statement in the court papers that I've read, at least, is challenging your assertions that you did not resign. Is the minister saying that she understood that press statement to be a resignation letter? You see, it is the other way around, unfortunately. I asked the question and you respond. You have asked... I just want to understand your question. So I'm asking for clarification of your question as to if you are saying, are you therefore saying to me that the minister's conclusion is therefore that that statement was a resignation letter? I just want to ask, if that, is that your question to me? No, that is not my question to you. Please, the minister will come and testify for herself, what her understanding is of your stepping down from ESCOM. All I'm saying is the minister in court documents is challenging your assertions that you did not resign. She's of the view that you've resigned. dispute that. The no. minister is challenging your statement that you did not resign. I cannot speak for the minister. Uh, I, 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 I do the accept. minister is challenging, if the minister has said something or has made a challenge in the court documents, she has made the challenge. And uh, if she wants to explain it further, I'm sure she will explain it to you when she comes here. I would never make a mistake of asking you to speak for the minister. Listen to the question. Listen to the question. You want to find out why am I bringing all this information? Why am I inquiring into this aspect? The point I'm making is it is a source of legal dispute. That is the point that I want to make. Let's move on. Going back to the statement. asking you that my reading of that statement reflects a unilateral decision by yourself to walk away from ESCO. Is that understanding correct or incorrect? Mr. Vanara, the matter will be determined by the courts next week as to whether that statement was a resignation letter. Um, the, the statement may have expressed the fact that I have decided to move on. The question that I have, however, is, was the statement sufficient to be classified as a resignation letter in terms of the formalities at uh, ESCOM? I don't know. And that is why the matter is before the courts. But you before Parliament, and you have a constitutional obligation to account to Parliament. You were a group chief executive of ESCOM. I hope you haven't forgotten about that constitutional obligation you have. Have you? I have executed it in the sense that I have said to you that I do not consider the statement to have been a resignation letter. No, no, no. You must answer the question that I ask. 
I'm saying my reading of your statement when you say I have in the interest of good corporate governance decided to leave my employer desk to me suggest that you on your own took a decision that you were leaving ESCOM. Is that a right understanding of what you've written in a statement? Yes or no? It is. However, it's not a straightforward answer of a yes or no. The question is, does that statement constitute a resignation letter? You, 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 you stepping down, it's, it is your unilateral decision, and it is for good corporate governance. Those are profound words. Those are profound words. And it is because the public protector's report has made these observations. You want to give the process time so that you can clear your name. Have you, have you had an opportunity to clear your name as of today? The public protector did not make any findings. The advice that I got was that in the absence of findings, there is nothing to clear. She just made observations. She doesn't even say that I met any of the Guptas. She says, I was in the Saxon world area. I don't know, Mr. Vanara, if you've ever been to Saxon world. <laughs> I, I, I haven't, I don't know how Saxon world looks like, but uh, let, let's come back to where we are today. You, 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 you see, there appears to be a contradiction that you, you are making. You say the public protector, I accept in your own statement, you're not saying there are findings against you, you consistently saying observations. And you say there's nothing to clear. But in your statement, this is what you say, nobody else. And I'm on that statement. It is your decision that you make because you want to clear your name. Can you record your response? It is my decision that I want to clear my name. But lo and behold, when I go and get legal advice about how do we then start clearing my name with this public protector's report, the lawyers say, but there is no finding. What is there to clear? I, I, my, I had a strong feeling, and Vanette Klein also said this earlier today, that that report needed to be taken on review. But the lawyer said, what are you taking on review? There is no finding. There's only one thing that the public protector said for certain, that the president must establish a commission of inquiry, and he has instituted a review. But the lawyer said it is ridiculous to think that you can say the public protector said you were in the area of sex and wealth and you want a judge to review that observation. No. I'm not interested in what you find out subsequent you making the statement. I'm at the time you're making the statement. That is where we are. At that stage, is it correct that you wanted to clear your name? Yes, it is correct. I'm asking if there has been an opportunity, because you seem to be saying in your statement, these things are going to be investigated further uh, because the report itself is not complete and uh, the the public protector has recommended for a commission of inquiry. No, I did not say so. I said the public protector herself says these things must be investigated further. Mm. So 
There has not been an opportunity to clear my name because she did not create an opportunity to create to clear my name. If there had been a further investigation, perhaps findings that uh, could be challenged or um, um, uh, proper observations that uh, alluded to, I don't know, uh, wrongdoing and so on, um, maybe um, there would be an opportunity to clear, clear my name. The frustration that I had and the thing that I was really very emotional about was because the public protector had written this report that said neither yay or nay, and yet that had weight in the public domain. Yeah, now let, let's just focus on these proceedings for now. The employer, your employer at the time, ESCOM, through the board, issues a similar statement on the same day. Do you know about the statement? Yes, sir. Let me remind you what ESCOM said. It is the Friday, the 11th, 2016, the same day that you made uh, the announcement. And this is the heading of the media statement. ESCOM GCE Brian Molife voluntarily steps down. Friday, 11 November 2016, it is with a great sense of loss and regret that the board of ESCOM announces a decision by ESCOM Group Chief Executive Brian Molife to step down in the interest of good corporate governance. In an effort to clear his name following the release of former public protector Tulima Donzella's report on her observations about the so-called state capture, Mr. Molife has decided to voluntarily step down to reflect and take time off. ESCOM chairperson Baldwin Ngubane said the decision taken by Mr. Molife was regrettable but understandable. Since joining ESCOM in April 2015, Mr. Molife and his executive management team have turned around the company's operational and financial performance. With 15 months of no load shedding, the impact of which has been enjoyed by every South African citizen. The improved performance of the power generating units coupled with additional capacity from some of our new build projects has resulted in a stable power system with excess capacity being exported to neighboring states. The company's liquidity position has also improved significantly with liquid assets increasing by 81.6% from 24.1 billion a year ago to 43.8 billion at 30 September 2016. In the face of CPI growth reported to be 5.1% as at 1 April 2016, the group has access to adequate resources, facilities to continue as a going concern for foreseeable future. The ESCOM board sincerely thanks Brian Molife for his relentless dedication to turning ESCOM around, solidifying a capable executive team and putting on a sound growth trajectory. ESCOM will soon be announcing the interim leadership arrangements. Once agreed with our stakeholder representative, the Honorable Minister Brown. 
That's where the statement ends. From this statement, I read the following, that you history at ESCOM, they are looking behind you to get your replacement. From this statement, what is your take? I think you're not correct, Mr. Vanara. The operative word there is decision. Mr. Brian Molefe has taken a decision to step down. At that point, I had issued a statement, ESCOM issued a statement. To the two statements constitute the action of resignation itself, or just contemplation, or just communicating a decision. You see, you can decide to go to Bloemfontein as you're sitting here now. It doesn't mean that you are in Bloemfontein or you have gone to Bloemfontein until you actually do it. So that was two statements that talked about a decision that had been made but not implemented. The decision was implemented a couple of days later when I in fact formally wrote a letter requesting early retirement. Had that early retirement been declined, I would still be at ESCOM. That with the greatest of respect, and if this is your attitude uh, to responding to questions, we'll leave here 1 a.m. Perhaps that is why we must leave it to the courts. No. You must please assist the committee by responding to the question. I've now gone through the trouble of reading ESCOM's statement, not your statement. For now, we're done with your statement. We're talking about this statement issued by your employer. And I'm saying to you, what I read from the statement, when they say, for instance, ESCOM will soon be announcing the interim leadership arrangements once agreed with our shareholder representative. They thinking behind Brian Molife. Is that a fair reflection? I think ESCOM was appreciating the fact that something was about to happen. So the, when the board says, ESCOM board sincerely thanks Brian Molife for his relentless dedication. Was this a thanking in advance? No, no, it was just a thanking for my relentless dedication. The minister will be here tomorrow and one of the questions she will be responding to is on her understanding of you stepping or leaving ESCOM. But the papers that I've read seem to be consistent with your decision that you communicated through your statement, seems to be consistent with what I read from your employers. And it is a version that she has put before court. I don't know if she's still going to put it tomorrow, but I'm saying the one that is before court is that you resigned. What is your response to that? Uh, Mr. Vanara, if you go through the documents, you will see that the minister put a version before court at the beginning of the labor court, uh, sorry, of the high court application under oath. And in that version of hers that was uh, uh, deposed in an affidavit under oath, she said that uh, she accepted the common mistake that had been done and accepted that uh, therefore 
the legal position was that Mr. Mulefe could return and that Mr. Mulefe had not resigned. Later on, she changed a version that she had already put before court under oath to another version, and even later on, a third version. So I will say to you, Mr. Vanara, if you go through those documents, you will go through, you will find three versions under oath by the minister. In the internal communication that ESCOM sends to the staff that you are leaving behind or you left behind at ESCOM, Dr. Ngubane tells the officials at ESCOM that you had resigned, which seems to be consistent with the statement at least made by the board. What is your take on that? Do you have the internal communication, if I can look at it? Yes, I do have it. Um, I can read it for you. I can read it for you. Um, In the meantime, you can take some water, sir. I'm fine, ma'am. I'm fine. Um, I'm referring to our witness. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. This is uh, the statement. It comes from a message from the chairman. It reads as follows. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll check on the date. But let's first read the statement. Dear colleagues, the ESCOM board recently announced the resignation of Mr. Brian Molife as ESCOM group chief executive officer effective 1 January 2017. To minimize the impact on business operations, the ESCOM board is pleased to announce that Mr. Machela Coco, currently Group Chief Executive Generation Division, has been appointed as acting group chief executive officer, as from 1 December 2016. Mr. Coco will act until a new group chief executive has been appointed. as from 1 December 2016, sorry. Mr. Coco is a member of the executive committee and has worked alongside Brian in turning operational performance of ESCOM. We have full confidence that Mr. Coco will continue to steer organization with the same determination and drive. Mr. Coco holds a BSc in Chemical Engineering from the University of Cape Town and an MBL from UNISA. He has been with ESCOM for the past 21 years. I would like to thank all employees for your sustained contribution during this transition, transition period. 
I encourage you to continue with your efforts under the new leadership of Mr. Koko and the executive team as you continue to contribute to South Africa's growth and development. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Koko on his new appointment. Unfortunately, I don't see a date uh, on, 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 on this statement, but I'm sure it's an issue that uh, could well be clarified. But the point I'm making is there seems to be consistency, one, in your unilateral decision, two, in the communication at least from ESCOM to the world and ESCOM internally around you having resigned. What is your response to that? I don't know if Mr. Ngubane wrote that statement or when he wrote it, but what is of significance is the letter that I wrote to him was to request for early retirement. Now, the reason I was asking when he wrote that was to determine if he wrote that statement after he had received the letter that I wrote to him, in which case I would be surprised why he did that. But needless to say, Mr. Mgubani later on had an opportunity to make an affidavit under oath in these court proceedings. And in that affidavit, he says, I took early retirement and I did not resign. I accept that. And we will deal with Dr. Ngubane when he's fit uh, to come testify before the committee. But from what we have now as we speak in front of us. Would you accept that it would appear that the evidence suggests that you resigned from ESCO? I do not understand why, Mr. Vanara, you are choosing to ignore the official document that I wrote that would determine um, whether or not I get early retirement and insist that I have resigned when I have never written an official document that was going to go into my file uh, of letter of resignation. I don't know why you ignore the fact that I did write a formal letter to the chairperson as is expected uh, of a person in my position to say that I'm in fact uh, resigning. I'm sorry, I'm in fact uh, taking early retirement. Um, and, and, and that you try to insist that I resigned because the unofficial documents say so. Unless you want to disown your statement that uh, you voluntarily uh, communicated to South Africans and the world. Is that your stance now? No, I'm not disowning it. I'm just saying that that was not a letter of resignation. We'll get to the internal communication. We'll get to all of that. But for now, you must agree with me that from your statement on the 11th of November, confirmed by the board statement on the same day, that based on these documents, we'll get back to the others, based on these documents, and the only inference to draw is that you resigned. Mr. Vanara, if you make a statement that you want to get married, it does not mean that you got married. And until you appear in front of a marriage officer and finalize the marriage, it has not happened. So I do not understand why those statements, which are not official documents, constitute a resignation letter. But then again, I'm not a lawyer and you are an advocate, so maybe there is a legal side to it. 
let's go to the pension fund. In your narration of your statement, you come across as an individual who's very eloquent in the rules of the pension fund. Is that a fair assessment? No, I wouldn't say I'm eloquent in the rules of the pension fund. I'm sorry, I couldn't, uh, I, I didn't get the answer. What is the answer? Your question was, I come across as a person who is eloquent in the rules of the pension fund. I say I do not consider myself to be so. To the extent that uh, you have been able to identify relevant issues that pertained to you getting a pension from ESCOM, you seem to be demonstrating to the committee that you understand those rules, at least. Uh, the rules of the pension fund, um, I understand because uh, of the legal advice that I have received and have been, it has been explained to me what the rules say. So on my own, I cannot call myself an expert on the rules of the pension fund. So this statement of yours, did somebody draft it for you? The one that you read uh, before the committee this evening, has it been drafted by somebody else on your behalf? I drafted it and um, because um, I have lawyers that have been working on this case, uh, I got them to read it and uh, we edited it together but it was a statement that I drafted on my own and it was edited with the assistance uh, of legal advice. Of, of and you are satisfied that the statement reflects what you want to share with the committee? Indeed, Mr. Van, Van, Van Nara. And therefore, when I say reading your own statement that you are happy with, I gather that you have a fairly good understanding of what the rules of the pension fund, at least those that are applicable to the pension regime. Mr. Vanara, what I'm saying is I do not consider the statement that I have drafted to make me an expert on pension fund matters. Uh, you seem to say that because I wrote that statement, I must be an expert on pension fund matters. I can assure you, you can, after these proceedings, play this tape repeatedly. You wouldn't find me making a reference to you being an expert on pension fund. The question is a very simple question. If you don't want to answer it, please say so. Because I feel we're a bit wasting the committee's time. The question is, you've prepared a statement, you own the statement. You've taken us through the statement. And I'm saying my reading of you is that you understand the relevant rules of the fund that are applicable to your pension regime. Yes, is that correct or is it incorrect? No, it does not necessarily mean that I understand the relevant rules. Let me point out a very simple rule, a very simple rule. And before I get there, earlier on you made a you made two distinctions. You got a letter from both the minister and the board, Dr. Ngubane, saying you have been permanently employed. That was a testimony. Yes. And this, you were then based on that, admitted to the pension fund as a permanent employee. That is a testimony. Yes. Within a matter of days, this thing gets to be sorted out, this confusion. I sympathize with you. Your employers did not seem to understand the regime that they were employing you under. 
Some were saying you are permanently employed, others say, no, let's change it, let's let it be a five-year contract. I, I get that. That is the message you are communicating, isn't it? No. It was not a matter of days. I was employed as a permanent employee. A month later, not a matter of days, a month later, a letter was received from the minister that I should sign a five-year contract. The five-year contract was signed in March the following year. So it was not a matter of days. And in fact, in my head, there was no confusion. I had been employed as a permanent employee, which was changed to a five-year contract. Exactly. When it changed, when your employment status changed, the pension fund is on record that they started deducting your contributions or receiving contributions later than the date that you had joined, but then the contributions were back paid. Any reason to dispute that testimony? I don't know when the pension fund received the documents or when they loaded me onto the system. I really don't know. I have never investigated that. If you don't know, then you must accept the wording of those who know. Isn't that so? You don't know. Uh, are you talking about faith? I'm sorry? Are you talking about faith? When you say, if you don't know, you must accept those that know. I'm saying, because you don't know when your contributions started to be paid over to ESCOM. They might have been deducted from your salary or there must have been a confusion. But at least the pension fund knows when they started receiving your contribution and you cannot challenge them on that. Yes. Now, when you knew then that the pension has now changed, I mean your employment status changes from permanency to a fixed term five year contract. And when the rules of the fund preclude contract employees from membership of the fund, on what basis then did you think you could become a member of the fund? I received a letter from the minister on the 2nd of October, which, was, which had no limitation on uh, And I subsequently got a letter and a contract from ESCOM. On the 1st of November, the minister wrote a letter to Dr. Ngubani. And um, after the minister wrote a letter to Dr. Ngubani, I got a letter from Dr. Ngubani, which is in the documents, uh, do you know, which is. Mm -hmm. The letter from Dr. Ngubani on the uh, on the, uh, on the 11th of November, page 52, says, you will be required to enter into a fixed term employment contract. So, the actual entering into the fixed term employment contract happened in March. March. March of which year? 2016, the following year. But it is backdated, back to the 1st of October 2015. Isn't that so? Yes. It is backdated to the 1st of October 2015, but between the 1st of October to the time when I signed the contract, I was a permanent employee until that changed. Now, what is interesting is that 
That contract that I signed in March also says you will continue to be a member of the ESCOM pension fund. In the rules of the ESCOM pension fund, I think it's rule number 13 if I'm not wrong, it, uh, it says that uh, if you have become a member of the pension fund, um, you will continue to be a member of the pension fund even as long as your service continues. No, 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 we, we're not there. I mean, clearly that means uh, if you are eligible and you join, and you become part and parcel of the furniture, so long as you're in service, you become part and parcel of the fund. It, uh, not, it cannot be interpreted to entitle illegible candidates who erroneously find themselves into the pension fund uh, scheme to continue to be members of the pension fund. I don't know. Um, perhaps you're saying that, therefore, that when I signed as a, uh, a, a, when I signed the contract in March, my membership should have been revoked. Not only from March. Remember, your contract of employment, albeit signed in March. You started earning a salary of group chief executive, not on an acting capacity, but as a group chief executive now, from October 2015. Is that not the case? That is correct. So, your actual employment on the contract basis starts on the 1st of October 2015, and on the 1st of October 2015, you are not eligible to become a member of the fund, in terms of not my rules, of the fund rules, which you claim to belong to. But, uh, Mr. Vanara, the letter that I got on the 2nd of October, and the contract that I signed shortly thereafter, in October, did not specify the term of contract. No, no, no. Let, 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 let us be clear on one thing. You are a permanent at a, at a specific time. It's communicated to you. I sympathize with you. But that decision gets to be changed. You had an option then to kick the fuss and say, I'm suing you for breach of contract or I'm walking away from this thing, or I accept the new terms. That was a decision you had to make. You accept that? Yes, I agree. And you voluntarily took a decision to accept that five-year contract of employment? Yes, I did, sir. And by accepting that contract of employment, you could not have been a member of the fund, because the rules of the fund, Mr. Cebu was here, says contract employees are not eligible to be members of the pension fund. Um, legal counsel has just shown me a section in the pension fund rules, uh, page 78, which says an eligible employee is an employee who at the date of becoming a member, at the date of becoming a member. So at the date when I became, first became a member of the pension fund, I was a eligible employee. But I don't know if your point, therefore, is that in March, when I signed that contract that applied retrospectively, my membership of the pension fund should have been revoked retrospectively. No. I'm saying when you were employed, on a contract, 
and that employment is 1st October. You get the re it gets the resolved sometime in March 2016. But by virtue of the nature of your employment with ESCOM, you are disqualified from being a member of the ESCOM pension fund. That is what the testimony of the chief, the chief executive and the principal officer of the ESCOM Pension and Provident Fund. What is your response to that? This is a factual issue, I think. Well, Mr. Graves says it is a legal issue because if he said it, he's wrong in law. Um, but I don't know, this is a matter before the courts. Um, uh, I also don't know why you're ignoring the fact that I had been a permanent employee until the change was made. Um, uh, although it applied retrospectively. So I accept that it is a matter before the courts. Um, but the point is, even if I had not been um, eligible to be a member of the pension fund. I have accepted that there was a mistake. Now, what you simply proving is that there were a lot of mistakes. That I did not qualify for early retirement, which I agree. And now you're saying I was not eligible to be a member of the pension fund. Maybe the court will agree with you. Uh, it is a matter that will be ventilated between the legal uh, people. Uh, but I accept that. I have already said that the whole thing was a mistake. And therefore, I asked, where does it leave me? The, where do these mistakes leave me? I, I accept your candidness, but there could well be another perspective to this transaction. And that is where I'm coming from. That you resigned, and the issue of the retirement ring on, I mean the early retirement, was an afterthought. What, how, how do you respond to that? There is no other formal document that I wrote to the board about early retirement or resignation. There is only one document which said, I hereby request for early retirement. Either way, you didn't quite, you're requesting for early retirement in terms of the 9 February resolution of the people and governance uh, resolution. Is that correct? Yes. But clearly in terms of that resolution, you do not qualify. Accept? Why do you say so? Let's go back to, to that resolution. Do you have it? Just, uh, is it part and parcel of your statement, Anakshas? Can you draw me? Page 64. Okay. It says, uh, at, a, at this meeting uh, on 9 February, the People and Governance Committee, blah, 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 resolved the following. The current pension and uh, provident fund rule that employees may proceed on retirement from age 50 with 10 years service remains applicable. Now you at ESCOM for less than two years. So this can't be applicable to you. 
What is the answer? So, uh, paragraph two of that resolution says, in cases where executive directors decide to take early retirement and there is a shortfall regarding the EPPF's 10 years service rule, ESCOM shall. So it dealt with the instance where you don't have 10 years service. No, no, no. That is not what I'm, I'm reading here. Perhaps let me assist you. Maybe you should read paragraph two then. Now you need to read the entire resolution. Let's read the entire resolution. Not one only. Yes, let's read the entire resolution. Okay. Let me help you. The current ESCOM pension and provident fund rule that employees may proceed on retirement from age 50 with 10 years service applies. In cases where executive directors appointed on fixed term contracts decide to take early retirement and there is a shortfall regarding EPPF 10 years rule, ESCOM shall breach. Yes. So you must be 10 years at ESCOM. Yeah, you must be 10 years at ESCOM, and if you're not 10 years at ESCOM, and you are an executive director who's decided to take early retirement, and there is a shortfall of the 10 years, ESCOM shall breach. That's my understanding. Okay, it, it, it is an issue of interpretation with which I, I, I differ with your interpretation. Nonetheless, you were not a member of the fund, irrespective of what they are trying to do. You didn't qualify. Not only was I not a member, this resolution is wrong because it says that in terms of the pension fund rules, the pension fund rules don't say so. I have admitted that the PNG made a mistake. I, that I have admitted. I have admitted in the court papers that there was a mistake. In fact, this mistake was the basis that made the legal advice, I'm told, to say that the situation must therefore revert to status quo ante because of the common mistake. Okay, so I mustn't waste time. You accept that there was no basis for the for ESCOM to pay money uh, to the ESCOM pension fund as a pension because of this mistake? Yes, I accept that. Sorry for wasting your time. Uh, I'm sorry for wasting your time. Okay, can we then move to others? You had it uh, and you are loaded for, and this is, I'm wrapping up. Uh, you, you are loaded for a very good uh, work that you did at ESCOM. Uh, I have no reason, I have no evidence to challenge that. But two of your non-executive directors this morning and this afternoon complained about documents that were submitted by your executives that were incomplete, that were misleading to a board of which we were a member of. What is your take on that? Oh, that was a big problem, sir. Uh, madam. Um, the practice at ESCOM, which was very foreign to me, was that members of the executive could compile documents and uh, take them to board subcommittees as well as to the board without going through some process at the executive level. It is a culture that I tried very hard to change. The structure, I, if you look at the governance structure of ESCOM, I think you must also look at the governance structure below the, um, the board. So you have BTC, 
board tender committee. You had a committee in the executive that reported directly to BTC. Chief executive was not a member of that committee and did not necessarily see the documents from that committee. It was a source of huge frustration for me. Uh, in fact, uh, um, we tried to change the, that governance structure because the way that I would have preferred that we operate was that all subcommittees at EXCO level are subcommittees of EXCO. Everything that goes to board subcommittees and the, um, the board must actually come from EXCO itself. It was not always the case that things came from um, EXCO to the board. Uh, in fact, that was more the exception than the rule. The, the practice had uh, uh, been that uh, there are subcommittees, uh, BTC is one that comes to mind, that uh, could meet that the EXCO subcommittees and then go directly to EXCO without having gone through the executive committee or, or even without having made recommendations to the chief executive officer. Lastly, on my side, let's deal with the target. Target, yes. The prepayment. How come that ESCOM prepays coal to a company that does not own a mine? Firstly, let me put in a disclaimer. You will have noticed from Ms. Daniels' uh, uh, evidence or uh, testimony that uh, a meeting was called on the 11th in the evening. And I was not in that meeting, nor was I invited. And she lists the names of people that were invited. But having said that, it does not mean that I do not know anything about the subject I have appraised myself and I know about it. Um, if you read Piers Marsden's um, uh, um, testimony section 44, here. Section 34 statement. No, when he was here. Okay. Yeah. He says they had sold the coal to Tegeta. They had sold the Judicial managers or the business rescue managers had sold the coal to Tegeta. Let me quote him verbatim because as you were talking to Veroshni, I went back to his testimony and I got the exact quote. Uh, on a question from Mr. Vanara, Mr. Mazden says, and I quote, I think first of all, the rationale for the money would need to be interrogated in the first place. Optimum coal mine was in business rescue, so it clearly was financially distressed. We had, however, negotiated better payment terms on the Honrina contract. This coal supply agreement was between Tegeta and between ESCOM and not between Optimum and Tegeta. Uh, Optimum and Tegeta. So in terms of a very optimum coal, mine point of view. We never supplied the coal to ESCOM. We supplied the coal to Tegeta on 30-day payment. So what he describes there is a transaction where, for whatever reason, the um, business rescue sold the coal to Tegeta. Tegeta turns around and says to ESCOM, we have coal, we can sell you coal. And that is how the prepayment was agreed to. The prepayment or the pre-purchase of the coal was necessary because we were in winter. And operations said, it's actually a very, very long story, sir, if you can allow me. It doesn't start there. It starts in December. Because I, I heard uh, during the testimony that there was a lot of confusion about why Tegeta was selling ESCOM, coal to ESCOM at 400 rand. There was a mine there at Arnott. Arnott Power Station has been supplied by Exaro 
40 year contract, sir. 40 year contract that ended in December 2015. The price of the coal on that contract was 1,132 per ton. Compare to the 150 that we were, get, we were paying at uh, Optimum. In fact, I suspect the reason Optimum wanted an increase was because of this differential. But there was a contract 40 years that was coming to an end in December 2015. Exaro wanted to renew the contract at 100, so 1,400 per ton. And we said no. We allowed the contract to lapse because it was expensive. And they were not prepared to come down to four or 500 rand, which is what I say would have been the market price. Uh, because we were not going to renew at 900, at 700, at 600, no. Uh, and they wanted 1,400. So when the contract ended, because, and that mine is right next to um, Arnott, we went to buy coal from other coal mines in the area, nine of them, including from Optima. That coal that they were selling to us at 150 in Henrina, they had an opportunity to sell it to us at 450 rand or 476 rand at Arnott. And at Arnott, it was a good deal because we had been paying 1,132 per ton at Arnott. So in May, this contract came to an end. Six of the nine suppliers said they could not continue supplying coal. Three said they could. Of the three, Optimum was there. Optimum had been, was in the nine, original nine. The list, the list was sent to me, I can provide it. The list of the, of the nine, Umsimbiti was one of them. I had, uh, uh, I think, Veneta talking about Umsimbiti. So then, Optimum started selling coal at 475. But what was interesting is that uh, uh, they started supplying coal there. By the time we wanted to buy the coal for the winter, the judicial manager says, but we've sold the coal to Tegeta on a 30 day repayment, payment terms. And so the prepayment was done with Tegeta. The prepayment was done with Tegeta. The coal, the 576 million, was for coal for May, June, July. By the end of July, in August, all the coal that had been bought in terms of that contract had been delivered. So we bought coal for 576 million and the coal was delivered. There is no question that we lent money and so on. It was a prepayment. Prepayment was very normal in this business. It had been done over and over again. P.S. Masden also says that. So uh, that is my understanding of what happened. But uh, it is what the understanding that I get from interrogating the officials, uh, uh, the CFO, and the head of generation, I believe they will come here and I hope they can explain the matter better, uh, especially because uh, I had not been to the meeting uh, on the 11th. Let's quickly deal with the guarantee. One or two questions. Why which, the guarantee? Which guarantee? That APSA gives to Tegeta for when? one point. In December? In December of 2015. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a long story. <laughs> but let me tell you about the story. On the 1st of December, 2015, I had a uh, rotator cuff operation repair, repair or, or rotator cuff repair operation, which was to repair the rotator cuff under general anesthetic. During that operation, I had pulmonary edema, which means my lungs were flooded with water, and I did not come back for the operation for about uh, 24 hours, between 24 and 30 hours. 
and I was on life support. For the rest of December, I was at home recuperating. In fact, I came back in the middle of uh, January. The, the, uh, the, the agreement that you're talking about with APSA was concluded during December, but I can assure you it was never exercised. ESCOM did not lose one cent. By March, that guarantee was cancelled without being utilized. So I got briefed about it when I returned, but it was never utilized. I can't say I stopped it. It was never utilized, and in March it lapsed. Mr. Singh, when he comes here, he will explain better. In fact, I think he was the acting GCE at the time. You're very emphatic uh, in your statement that uh, whoever buys the mine must buy the fine. I think it's clear in the statement. Why does the fine then disappear after Tegeta acquires the mine? Did it? Yes. They didn't pay 2.4 billion, did they? No, they paid 600. Yeah, but... Yeah, so it did not disappear. It was 600. But let me tell you how uh, 600 was arrived at. And in fact, this matter also... Remember that I took early retirement in... Uh, end of December. Between January and March, there was an arbitration process. And it is out of that arbitration process that the fine was reduced to 600 million. Mr. Singh and Mr. Koko will tell you exactly about the size of the coal and the, pro the, the, the issues that led to the arbitration award of 600 million. Uh, what I do notice, however, was that Glencoe had refused to go on arbitration on the matter. Piers Marsden refused to go on arbitration on the matter. Uh, and he says this in, in his uh, testimony. He says, we used the rules of business rescue to avoid arbitration. I don't understand why they avoided arbitration. When I was there, my position was that the fine of 2.1 billion stands. And I even said to Mr. Glazenbeck, Mr. Glazenbeck, you can't ask us to write off 2.1 billion when we are trying to recover debt from Soweto. How do we go to Soweto and ask people to pay for electricity and yet we write Glencoe's debts off? So I was quite adamant that they should pay the 2.1 billion, but eventually after I had left, it was reduced through an arbitration process to 600 million. No further questions, sir. Thank you very much. Why I'm pointing out uh, hands, uh, Mr. Molifi, you can stretch the legs while I'm pointing out. Just around there, you can just stretch your legs. You've been seated for almost two, two hours. <laughs> you can just stand up and... Uh, okay. Luyenge, <laughs> Mazoni, Uh, Chivambu, Swart, is your hand up? Honorable Swart, um, Napulzeli, no one else, uh, <laughs> Honorable Kungubele. Honorable um, Raul, Raul, Honorable Gordon, 
Honorable Ranto. Okay, Honorable Le uh, <laughs> Mare Biatungala Mare. Honorable Mare and then Honorable Ranto. I've closed the list now. The list is closed. Thank you. Our members. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. And maybe let me indicate from the very onset, uh, uh, Mr. Molife, about the importance of this particular session. If all what is being said outside there about uh, ESCOM, and in particular your name, I think you should take this particular session very serious to clear your name and that of the institution and other chief executives of the SOEs. You, you came from uh, Transnet before you were seconded to, 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 to ESCO. Did you have any knowledge of any of a service provider at Transnet who had anything to do or owned by the Gupta family? Because this will be seen as if we are beating about the bush, but the problem that we have in the country, there is a hypothetical view that says there is looting of state resources in the SOEs and in particular ESCOM and Transnet. So all these technical questions and all of them, they don't reach where people out there want questions from because anybody who is in there with, uh, with money or an indication that this one is stinking money, they'll say this one has a, a Gupta. Can you clarify this Gupta issue? At Transnet, I'm not aware that uh, there had been any business between Transnet and Gupta-owned companies, unless I'm making a mistake, but I'm sure Mr. Gama can confirm that. Uh, but I'm not aware that uh, there is any company that is owned by the Guptas that has done business with Transnet. At ESCOM there was. They, they had been several coal supply agreements, uh, Brackfontein, uh, and then eventually they bought um, Optimum. Um, uh, but even the Brackfontein contract and the other Gupta-owned or Oak Bay and Tegeta contracts had been entered into prior to at least my arrival at the uh, ESCOM. So, um, so these were uh, coal supply contracts, like uh, other coal supply contracts. If I were to ask, is there any knowledge that you have pertaining to any of the Guptas that stops them to do business with government. Let's say here is this Atul or whoever, I don't know about them by their names. I thought by this time when you are coming here, you will be coming maybe with one or two of them because I would ask them questions to say, how did you come here? What is it that you are doing? Are you legal here? So I want to establish that. Is there anything criminal to do business with a particular person of that nature? Is there anything that actually is there that says these companies are not supposed to be used in our supply chain. Mr. Gordon will correct me if I'm wrong, but in the PFMA, it's very clear that um, a supplier who is unethical, who does not behave properly, must be blacklisted after the, a process. So you have to go through a process and then notify them and then blacklist them. But they have a right to be heard before you blacklist them. I'm not aware that the Guptas or any of their companies have been blacklisted uh, or that they've been found guilty of a crime in South Africa. Uh, I know there's a lot of things that have happened, but um, if you're sitting there and you're objective, uh, 
they would have to be blacklisted before you can say to the CEO of um, um, the um, Honor Step Board Veterinary Services, you can't do business with the Guptas. He will ask you, so where's the blacklisting? And to, the, to my knowledge, it doesn't exist. There is Glencore, there is Anglo-American. Those are other big companies that we know of with lengthy contracts with these SOEs, including, including ESCOM, Glencore, for 25-year uh, contract. What, what, is, what is the difference between these? Because there are these insinuations or there are reports some of the witnesses were saying here. There is work that uh, these Gupta-related companies received payments without having any contract with, with, with ESCOM. Uh, Mr. Luyang, um, I mean, this is, uh, I think people are talking about state capture. But if you want to talk about capture properly, substantive capture, you have to go to all those power stations and the mines that are close to the power stations and the contracts between those mines and those power stations. Uh, the uh, cost plus mines, which were developed with ESCOM's money. So what happens is that you as Mr. Luyenge get the mining license to open a mine next to a power station. ESCOM gives you the money to sink the shaft. And then you get a 40-year contract to supply ESCOM. And the price is agreed to. In the case of Exaro, it was 1,132. In the case of uh, Optimum, which was a 25-year contract, it's not necessarily that that contract was bad. The problem with that contract was that the bulk of the supply uh, had been for export. So when the export coal price tanked, they then had problems. And then they wanted to recover from uh, ESCO, which we did not allow. By the way, Mr. Piers Marsden says in his testimony that I found amusing, he says he could not believe that anybody could talk like that to Glencoe in the way that I had spoken to Glencoe. So Something, somewhere, we must have touched the raw nerve uh, a, and shaken a, a, a long existing relationship uh, that has to do with this. With this, uh, with this. I mean, if, if, if Mr. Luyenge, Parliament wants to um, understand state capture, I think with this uh, optimum mind deal, you are scratching on the surface. You need to go deep into those 40-year contracts. I've seen them. They've specified even where black people must stay and white people must stay in the mine with ESCOM's money. And nobody wants the Truth Commission about that. Nobody wants to talk about that. Those contracts continue as they were drafted 40 years ago. And in fact, in the case of Glencore, they have the audacity to say, they want to change the price from 150 to 530 at an additional cost of 1.96 billion rand per annum, 6 billion rand over three years, that ESCOM didn't have. And then Mr. Marsden says he couldn't believe that anybody could talk to Glencore like that. I think, personally, I think that was my problem. The Mackenzie uh, is contemplating to pay back the 1.6 billion, which they term it to be dirty money, which was paid directly uh, by ESCO. What's your take on that? Well, I know that Ms. Daniels has said in public that the money must be paid back. I, do not, I have not examined her reasons, and I have not also examined the reasons why Mackenzie wants to pay back uh, that money. But I'm sure that uh, the chief financial officer will, uh, when he comes here, Mr. Singh, uh, give the details of that contract and explain what actually happened. For... 
I, I rate my, I rest my case uh, in the interest of time and afford other members. Uh, <coughs> if these matters, matters of this nature, where there is this perception of the looting of state resources uh, in, in relation to, 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 to ESCO, Will you be shocked if there is anyone who will come with enough and sufficient evidence that says in one of the corners or in any of the corners, maybe include in, including the meetings that might be held at Saxon World, where there was ever a, a meeting that was a planning to, for, for certain people and organizations to loot state resources, would your name show amongst those that will come up? Will you be shocked if your name is there? No, I've never been in a meeting to discuss the looting of uh, state resources. I've never been in a meeting to discuss the looting of state resources uh, anyway. You have a problem. In fact, uh, Mr. Luyenge, if I can expatiate on that. This is a very strange thing. You know, when I arrived at ESCOM, we had a war room. Mr. Professor Eberhardt was here. I think he's left. Perhaps he didn't like what I was saying, but he's left. But what struck me about the war room, the problem that we had was load shedding. The problem that needed to be confronted head on was load shedding. The war room was shifting the deck chairs. Professor Everard was a member of the war room. To the point that we made presentations to the war room about how we think we can deal with this thing on Tetris and, and how we think we can improve the operations of the company. And um, government decided the war room was no longer necessary because ESCOM has got this thing under control. When the war room shut down and uh, load shedding ended, some of the members of the war room say, this thing is ending because there must have been looting. So now looting becomes the issue, not load shedding. Nobody talks about, somebody said today load shedding cost 450 million rand per day. It cost billions of rent per day just to have load shedding. That ended. When that ended, I suppose another crisis had to be manufactured because that one was gone. And it's gone for good because those young engineers that are there that are embedded at ESCOM uh, now have a way of managing the electricity generating plants in such a way that uh, we have sufficient capacity to generate electricity every day. I still have four minutes, Nature. Oh. Uh, lastly, Chairperson, uh, I, I want to maybe indicate the fact that here we are not investigating state capture. Here we are conducting our oversight. Whatever we found, whatever we find as something that is in breach of any law, we will tell Parliament and recommend to Parliament to go to where you say this is, the, this, this is the scratching of the surface. And maybe definitely the true the Judicial Commission of Inquiry, the one that will, be, uh, that, that will be appointed by the President, will get into that. But as a, citizens of, uh, as a citizen of the country, you have a responsibility to give us evidence to that effect and then send that to, to, to Parliament. If it does not get to where it's supposed to be, then you are engaged and more evidence and other people who might know of that particular fact, because here, we are not to, this is not a witch hunt. We want to get more, we are on a fact-finding mission about this corruption. Corruption is there, but we are not able to say this and that. This Gupta issue, is actually a, a, an issue that must assist us. We must be told uh, uh, about 
the beneficiaries of the Gupta families to tell us how do they do that? Uh, is, is that wrong? No. Is there any breach of the law in doing that? Thank you. I will cooperate, sir. Thank you in that order. Honorable Mazzoni. Thank you, Chairperson. Mr. Malefi, I'd like to start off with discussing the Public Protectors Report and uh, entitled The State of Capture. And I'd like to start off by saying you are 100% right um, that uh, certainly uh, you weren't accused of uh, seeing Mr. Atul Gupta, as you said earlier. The Public Protector spoke of AJ Gupta. You spoke of Atul Gupta. Um, and what the Public Protector said is that there were 58 telephone calls between AJ Gupta and Brian Malefi between August 2015 and March 2016, that at 19 times at or near Gupta's, the Gupta's Saxon World compound, uh, you were there between August the 5th and November the 17th of 2015. The compound? At the compound, at, at or around the compound. Now, what makes these times relevant is because they coincide with the acquisition of Optimum Coal by Gupta owned Tegeta. Now, Mr. Belefi, my first question, based on, on, on what the public protector, her observations would be this. At the now infamous press conference, where you read your statement, and you were there with Mr. Well, Dr. Ngobani, and to refresh your memory, it's the one where you, where you cried. Um, you spoke of a Shabin and you told the South African public that you were not at the, the Gupta's Saxonwold compound, but in fact at a Shabin near Saxonwold. Now, I'm sure you'll agree with me that every South African in this country is, is interested to know about the Shabin, and journalists have looked for it, and certainly many politicians have driven around the area looking for it. Would you tell this committee where exactly this, the location of the Shabin is? Chairperson, this is a very respectable... Um hearing, and I would appreciate it if members did not manufacture facts. If you read, or if you had been listening to the statement that I had read, because I read it out because I knew that some members may not read it. Paragraph 53, uh, uh, let me read it again. Paragraphs 5.96 to 5.101 deal with my phone records and make some notes, not findings, notes. Although the public protector makes notes, she did not ask me for my side of the story. 55, uh, she, sorry, paragraph 56. Paragraph 5.97 refers to contact between myself and Mr. A.J. Gupta on a number of occasions. These are the occasions that you're talking about. The public protector fails to provide any other details about the phone calls. She does not provide the phone numbers nor the dates and times when the phone calls were made. It is therefore difficult for me to determine the veracity of a claim in paragraph 5.97 of the report. Where I talk about Mr. Uh, Atul Gupta is where the public protector says, I made one phone call to him, and I say, that was not the phone call. Mr. Atul Gupta did call. The phone was not answered, because there she provided a date and time, and I was able to check in my records. There was a call at exactly that time that she says the call was made to the second, but I did not answer the phone, and there is no record in my phone that I returned that call. That is what I said, not the facts that you are now, Ms. Mazzoni, trying to manufacture. Now, secondly, on the issue of the Shebin, I will let you know that I complained to the press ombudsman about the Sunday Times reporting that I said I was at the Shebin. The press ombudsman asked Sunday Times to apologize because I had not said that I was at the Shebin. What got twisted was what I had been saying. And when I went on, if you go and listen to the video properly, and not just what the journalist had written, if you listen to the video uh, that was recorded when I was making that statement, I also said, every day, when I leave home and I go to ESCOM, I pass within one kilometer 
of uh, teasers. And when I go home, I pass there on the highway in Midrand. It's just, I get picked up by the same um, tower as the tower that is at teasers. Will you therefore come to the conclusion that I was at teasers every two times a day during the week? And I made that statement in that context. The ombudsman ruled against the Sunday Times, and I am surprised that some members of the press continue to publish that I said I was at the Shebin. I wasn't. It was investigated by a retired judge. Uh, he's, uh, he was at UNISA. Uh, uh, I forget his name now, with a bald head here. Uh, and uh, he found that I did not say that I was at the Shebin. So, right. so it will be better that we do not manufacture facts and sensation, uh, Ms. Mazon. Right. Let's not manufacture anything here and read exactly from a quote from Tuli Madonsela, Advocate Tuli Madonsela. She says, and I quote, We have evidence from a driver who recorded the registration numbers of cars coming in. He has a whole book of high-profile visitors, including Malefi. That's at the Saxon World Shabin. Will you please tell this committee... A simple yes or no answer. Have you been to the Saxonwald Gupta compound? When did she make that statement? She made it recently. When? When did she make that statement? Where was it? It is, is completely it irrelevant when she no, made it. it. Is relevant. She has made the statement, and I'm asking you now, no. did you or did you not ever I visit cannot, the Saxonwald compound? I cannot comment compound? on it. It is not part of the official documents. I, cannot, I do not know. But where it's a yes or no answer. Either you've been there or you haven't been there. That's what I'm asking. Have you ever been to the Saxonville Gupta compound? Yes or no? Yes, I have. You have. Fantastic. I have, I have never denied that I know the Guptas. I have That's said in this committee that uh, I had been invited to Diwali. I have met the Guptas. Incidentally, at about the same time, on the 30th of uh, August, uh, 2015, we suspended the Tegeta contract to supply coal uh, from the Brackfontein mine because of the quality issues. The Guptas were very angry with us. They requested meetings, they phoned, and uh, there was a lot of exchange to the point where eventually we agreed with them that uh, because they were disputing, they were saying that the people that are saying their coal is not of a good quality have been paid by the opposition and people that don't like them. So we took the coal to the South African Bureau of Standards to get tested. During that period, I did have contact with them, and we spoke about that issue. But I have said in this committee that I have known them for some time since they came into South Africa. They tried to do a deal at the PIC that never succeeded. So I knew them from that time. Uh, I have never denied that I know them. But that does not mean that uh, I have done anything wrong as far as they are concerned. Right. Let's talk about your time at the PAC, uh, PIC. Rather. There is an 11-month... Uh, with, with respect, Chairperson, my understanding was that we were going to talk about the ESCOM issues and uh, Chairperson, with respect, if Mr. Malefi wouldn't keep interrupting me, he uh, would see that I'm creating a chain of events. But I'm trying to object to your raising the PIC because that is not what I understood to be called here for. Uh, and I am not prepared, I have not prepared to talk about the PIC. Chair, may I finish my question? PIC. Because it actually has nothing to do with the PIC. I, I, Mr. Molefe, yes. you, you have a right to say yes or no. Uh, and also you can indicate if you feel uncomfortable but the member has the right also to ask a question for you to just say, respond in the manner that you feel that is comfortable for you to respond. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, Mr. Malefi, you worked at the PIC, and then you worked at Transnet, and then you worked at ESCOM. In between working at the PIC and Transnet, you had an 11-month break. Did you work or do any consultation work for the Guptas or any Gupta own company? No. No. All right. And if you're interested, I can tell you what I did, but I did not work for the Guptas. No, that's fine. Chairperson, the ex-Minister of Mineral Resources 
um, Mr. Ramshlodi, says that on an occasion, Mr. Malefi and Mr. Ngubani pressured him to help the Guptas take Glencore coal mine in 2016. What is your response to that allegation? I have spoken about it. Uh, I'd, I'd like you to, I can you read, read, but read I'd, like you to, I'd like you to respond to me, please. No, I'll read it again for you. Uh, about the time of the sale of the Optimum Mine, the Department of Minerals announced that Glencore's mining licenses have been suspended. That is on page 24 and 25 here, which is a, 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 a newspaper article talking about the suspension of the, of the, of the contract. Uh, the reason for the suspension was that Lenco had not followed due process in the proposed retrenchment of their workers. The effect of the suspension of the mining licenses would be to guarantee the suspension of coal supplies by optimum to Honrina. We were relieved when a few days later the suspension of the licenses was withdrawn. Minister Ramatlodi has said we tried to get him to suspend the licenses but he had in fact suspended the licenses, and that is in the press reports. Why would Mr. Ramatlodi lie? Why would he say that there was pressurization if there wasn't? I don't know. And I've never said Mr. Ramatlodi lied. I have a lot of respect for him. He's uh, very senior to me, a senior member of the ANC. Uh, I have never said that he lied. Perhaps maybe he made a mistake or maybe uh, he had forgotten some of the facts, but I have never said that he lied, and I would never say that he lied. I respect him immensely. All right. Let's talk a little bit about Trillion. During your tenure as CEO of ESCOM, the relationship between Trillion and ESCOM well and truly blossomed. In actual fact, I'll give you some dates because I, I've realized you, you enjoy dates. On the 14th of April 2016, an amount of 30.7 million rand was paid by ESCOM to Trillion for a corporate plan. On the 10th of August, 113.3 million rand was paid by ESCOM to Trillion for management consulting. Coincidentally, also on the 10th of August 2016, an amount of 122.2 million rand was paid for a financial advisory service by ESCOM to Trillion. And on the 14th of December 2016, an amount of 152.8 million rand was paid by ESCOM to Trillion for management consulting fees. Now, in a question that I asked Minister Brown about Trillion, I asked her about whether or not there was business going on between ESCOM and Trillion. And Minister Brown answered no and not applicable to the follow-up questions. Now, she's claiming that ESCOM did not tell her and give her the truth about the relationship between Trillion and ESCOM. Do you know why the incorrect information was given to Minister Brown, which then led her to mislead Parliament? Um, when was the incorrect information given to Ms. Brown? In a question that I asked her earlier in the year. Uh, which year? This year? Last year. I do not have details of what happened there. I do not have details of those transactions, and I'm sure that uh, Mr. Singh can shed light on them. But you see, this is, this is what I'm finding worrisome, Mr. Malefi. You were the CEO. That's the chief executive officer of ESCOM. It is the largest state-owned entity. It is a monopoly that has the ability to hold our country's economy to ransom. And on 10 occasions at the very least tonight, you have said to myself, colleagues, to Advocate Venara, that we must wait for Mr. Naj Singh to come and answer these questions. Surely you, as CEO of this enormous entity, this powerful entity, you have knowledge of amounts of money going into the hundreds of millions of rands, and you know what's going on in your company. Because if you don't, you failed very badly at corporate governance 
And that not only reflects badly on you, it reflects badly on, 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 on the way ESCOM is being run. So I, I fail to understand why you cannot give me details, because if you didn't know, then were things deliberately being kept from you? Is that, is that your assertion? No, I can understand why you fail to understand. Um, the committee sent me a letter with specific issues that the committee would like to discuss. That, the trillion was not in the list of things. I would have gone and researched it and jogged my memory about what happened at trillion. But for you, Ms. Mazzoni, to come here and hijack me with a transaction that happened on a specific date, a specific minute, while I was at ESCOM. In ESCOM, there are millions of decisions that get taken, billions actually of decisions that get taken on a daily basis by ESCOM employees that do not require the CEO to know about. There is a procurement decision that is being taken today at Majuba Power Station. There is a procurement decision that has been taken somewhere in Treasury. There is a, a decision that has been taken in the Treasury about ESCOM bonds that the CEO will not know about uh, on the spot or remember the details of. Uh, after the, such a period, long period of time has elapsed, or even when the period of time has not elapsed. So it would have been helpful if you had indicated that you would have a desire to know about those transactions so that I can prepare for your questions. Let me make it easier for you then, so that we both understand, because clearly that's what we need to do here. Did you know that ESCOM was doing work with Trillion? Yes or no? No. No. Right. Thank you for that blatantly honest answer. Mr. Malefi, I am one of the millions of South Africans who was deeply perturbed at your resignation slash retirement slash reinstatement because I, I, I don't know what to call it yet. I am I'm one of the millions of South Africans who read what I strongly feel to be your resignation letter. And the reason I don't uh, agree with you that it can be viewed as a retirement letter is because I quote from your very statement, you will say, you say in your second page, about halfway down, it's a one-liner. You say, I will take time to reflect before I decide on my next career move. Now, if you're retiring, you're not going to have a next career move. So how could we not, as South Africans, view this as a resignation letter? You state there clearly that you are going to take time and reflect before I decide on my next career move. Now, if you were retiring, I, I would expect perhaps a line to say, I'm going to take time and reflect and enjoy my rounds of golf and spending time with my family as so many people who, who uh, retire do, but you, you specifically mention that you're going to think about your next career move. Yes. Um, if you go to page 85 of the documents. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there is a letter there addressed to Dr. Ngubanya. Mm -hmm. Chairman of the ESCOM board, I hereby request approval for early retirement in terms of the rules of the pension fund. I do, not why, I do not understand why you choose to ignore that letter as my formal communication with ESCOM about my early retirement. I'll tell you why I choose to ignore it, Mr. Malefi, because as a formal communicate to the country, you, not me, not anyone else, you called a press conference and you read that statement to the country in which you informed the country that you would decide on your next career move. Yes, I would decide. But what did I do? I applied for early retirement. Mr. Malefi, I think you are, you are grabbing at straws there, but nonetheless, I have a copy the, of... The feeling is mutual. No, there we go. That, that's great. I'm so glad we finally agree on something. On the... I have the answering affidavit, 
the third and final one that Minister Brown has submitted, in which she says, on the 11th of November 2016, Mr. Malefi resigned as CEO of ESCOM. I issued a press statement and found in founding papers that I respected his decision to resign. At the time I made the statement, I was not aware of the fact that Malefi had in fact applied for early retirement and that ESCOM had on the 11th of November 2016 accepted such application. I was under the impression that this was a case of a unilateral resignation and nothing more. In particular at the time, I issued the press statement not aware of the following fact. An early retirement agreement had been concluded between ESCOM and Mr. Malefi. This agreement, as I now understand it, was to construe Mr. Malefi's resignation as early retirement in terms of the rules of the ESCOM pension fund. I would like to know from you, did you deliberately resign and then decide to retract your resignation when you found out that you would be able to apply through Dr. Ungabani for early retirement? Ms. Mazzone, as I was saying to Mr. Vanara, you would have to consider my press statement as a resignation letter, something that I dispute. Um, uh, I do not know that uh, if, if I had issued the press statement and done nothing else, uh, that I would have resigned. Uh, or if I had issued the press statement and ESCOM had issued a press statement, that the two press statements would have amounted to a resignation. I think the court will have to determine um, the uh, status of the press statements with respect to my uh, formal employment and my employment contract at ESCOM. Now, Minister Brown is the stakeholder and Minister of Public Enterprises, of course, has very close dealings with the boards, executive boards of the state-owned entities. And one would assume that in a decision of the importance of the resignation slash retirement of one of their CEOs, she would have a discussion with you about it. Um, Minister Brown says, all of the correspondence passed without my knowledge. I was not party to the early retirement agreement between ESCOM and Mr. Malefi. Did you at any time discuss the issue with Minister Brown that you decided to retire or that you decided to resign? I did as a matter of courtesy go to Minister Brown's house and um, talked about my impending leaving. The matter is in, uh, so yeah, the, uh, the matter is in the court papers. Uh, yes, we did talk about it when I went to her house uh, in, in Cape Town. And did you tell her that you had decided to take early retirement or did you tell her that you had decided to resign? Minister Brown says her recollection is that I said I resigned and I disputed that in the court papers. Right. So there's a, there's a, a very clear dispute between yourself and, and Minister Brown as to the resignation or retirement. Now, you, you had a brief stint in Parliament as a, as a member of Parliament. You were sworn in very close after the time of, of your resignation slash retirement. Now, if you retire, one assumes that you, you won't commence work and, and certainly be remunerated for it. Um, but be that as it may, Parliament has an ethics code which members of Parliament sign and adhere to. And one of those is if you have other remuneration or other employment, you declare it on a declaration of interest. When you filled in the declaration of interest while you were an MP, did you declare your retirement income from ESCOM on your declaration of interest? I can't remember that I filled in a declaration of interest. If I did, I would have, but I can't remember that I did. Right, that's concerning. Um, did you, another, another rule of Parliament is that if you have any employment outside of being an MP, your chief whip has to sign off on it. And in your case, your chief whip would have been Jackson and Temple, Honorable Jackson and Temple. Did you have any signed agreement with Jackson and Temple that you, you had alternative income? Because when you returned to ESCOM in what was called a reinstatement, ESCOM issued a statement to say you were simply on a, a leave of absence at the time. 
and that your employment slash resignation slash retirement actually hadn't taken place. So effectively that means you, according to the Ethics Code for MPs and the Powers and Privileges Act, you actually did not qualify to be a member of parliament. Yes. Um, I, I did not uh, have other employment. I was a pensioner. Uh, I do not know if you consider a pensioner to be employed, uh, such that they have to declare their salary or uh, income. But I was a pensioner. Uh, uh, at the time, I had a letter from the Escom Pension Fund that welcomed me as a pensioner. I'm not aware of any um, rule in parliament that precludes pensioners to becoming members of parliament. So ESCOM then erred when you were, they said that you had been reinstated following just a brief stint away from the company? I had not actually, strictly speaking, been reinstated, if you read the court papers. My contract of employment was still valid because the early retirement had been void ab initio. It was a mistake, it was a common mistake. So the original contract of employment was still in, play, in, in place, and that was the uh, legal opinion. And it is the basis on which um, ESCOM asked me to return to work because my contract of employment uh, was still in place. So strictly speaking, if your employment of, your employment of, your contract of employment was still in place, then you were employed by ESCOM and you did not qualify to be an MP, strictly speaking. No, um, I was not aware that I was, the contract of employment is still in place because I was under the impression, I labored under the false impression that I had been, I had retired. It's it is only when the mistake was discovered that we, uh, ESCOM agreed to um, ask me to return to work because the contract of employment was uh, uh, still valid. And when that mistake was discovered, I promptly resigned from parliament. Right, I see, I, I see ESCOM's corporate governance is really under scrutiny here because to make a mistake of that magnitude, I'm sure you'll agree with me, is, is, is worrying. The pension fund as well. And the pension fund as yes. well, indeed. It's very, very worrying. Tell me, Mr. Malefi, you have until November to pay back the pension money. Um, do you have to pay back that money with the interest to the pension fund or have you reached an agreement? We had reached an agreement um, when I went back, when the contract was continuing. Part of the, what we call the reinstatement agreement, but really which governed my coming back to ESCOM, uh, said that the money that had been paid to me would have to be repaid uh, back to the pension fund. Uh, and I agreed, and I signed that agreement to say that I will pay back the money that had been paid in terms of the pension arrangements. But then that was rescinded. So it was rescinded, so that money is in your bank account now earning interest until the 30th of November where it gets paid over? No, until the court determines what my status is. I don't know now what I am. Uh, uh, I have been... So we don't know either. Yeah. So that's, so, so, so so that's that I think you're a colonel, aren't you? Yeah, that's common cause. The matter, the matter will be determined in court, uh, I hope, next week. If not next week, we have to go to... You know, this thing is very strange, because now I, I went to the Labour Court, and the mm. judge said, no, go back to the High Court on the DA matter. At, at the High Court, I'm a respondent. And a judge refused to hear my case where I was the applicant, asking, excuse me, what is my status now? Can the court please determine? And the judge says, go back to the high court where I'm a respondent. So we're going back to the high court, and uh, I'm not sure what the high court is going to say. Uh, we may have to go back to the labor court afterwards, and then we will get clarity of what is happening. Now, Mr. Malefi, in your, your stint as an MP, um, MPs pay into the pension fund for members of parliament. 
did you receive a, a pension payout from a, a pension, did Parliament pay into the pension fund for you? And upon your resignation as a member of Parliament, were you paid any form of money for your pension from Parliament or did they transfer any sum of money to another pension fund for you? No, I don't know what happened to that pension. It was, I don't know, three months. I, I never followed it up. You I, never followed yeah, it up. I, I was not paid that money. That was the contributions which I made when I was here. I never followed them up. Do you not think it's strange that you haven't followed it up? Because, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's in fact, you know, th there's a lot of complications here. It's, this is a very intricate web that we, we're developing here because your, your retirement is now viewed to be void ab initio. Uh, your contract at ESCOM is now deemed to have never cancelled because your retirement is deemed to be void ab initio. Your qualification to be a member of parliament is now brought into question because were you employed at ESCOM because of the void ab initio? Should you have been receiving a parliamentary pension money? Um, you know, and that's the government pension scheme. That's, you know, that's a lot of South Africans that contribute towards that scheme. The government pension fund. Yeah, but it's not prejudiced. I did not take the money there. In fact, uh, if anything, I made contributions. But I resigned from parliament. So those would have been resignation benefits. I'm not sure how much. Are you were. sure you resigned from parliament? <laughs> no, I, 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 I need to make sure. You, you are 100% sure that you, you sent a letter of resignation to parliament? Yes, I did. Right. Uh, one, my last question, Chairperson. Um, Mr. Malefi, I've been listening very carefully uh, to, to what you've said about Optimum Coal and why the deal with Optimum Coal fell short and why the, the issue unraveled in the way it did. And one of the things that, that you brought to our attention was that Optimum Coal um, a, they threatened to stop supplying, which would result in load shedding, and B, that they were going to charge us 530 rand a ton for, for coal. Now, yesterday, uh, Glencore released a statement saying, and I quote, uh, it's, in, it's in the public domain, at no stage did Optimum Coal Mine raise the topic of load shedding in its discussions with ESCOM, and the last offer made by Optimum Coal Mine while well, under Glencore's control was 300 rand a tonne until 2018. So there's a dispute now. A, in, did they threaten load shedding? And B, from 500 rand to 380, which is quite a difference. Can I have your comment on that, please? Well, they can come and testify here if they wish mm -hmm. uh, and dispute what I said. Uh, but they did talk about there will be more load shedding if... Uh, uh, they stop supply of coal to um, to uh, Henrina. In fact, they didn't have to say it. It's just like that. They would have been uh, if they stopped the supply. Now, 300 rand. I don't know why that makes you comfortable because increasing the price from 150 to 300. Sorry, I didn't say that it made me comfortable. I said that I'm quoting directly from an article that said that the negotiation said 300. So let's not manufacture anything here. I Quoting yeah, from an article, it certainly doesn't make me comfortable. I'd like to know from you whether that's obligation. true or not. They had a contractual obligation to supply us with coal at 150 rand until 2018. Agreeing to increase that by five cents would have been wrong. Mr. Malefi, my last question for now. Do you have any overseas bank accounts, um, perhaps in Dubai or Switzerland, or, and, and are they declared? No, I don't have bank accounts outside South Africa. Thank you. Honorable members, there's still another witness that is coming. Yeah, we're, we're aware, Chair. Just a reminder, I'm not, I'm not going to stop anyone. Just a reminder. And I think as a chair, I have a right to remind you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, just briefly, you know, uh, should we refer to you as Mr. or as, as Colonel Mulife? Or 
is, is, is the, the title of Kennel an appropriate one to refer to you? Or we can just refer to you as uh, Mr. Molife. When we dealt with uh, the terms of reference for this process that we're engaged in, we ultimately adopted a document which said that the object of this process is to investigate allegations of governance failures at ESCOM, Transnet, and DINEL. And broadly because of a genuine observation that had been made that there's a family, a Gupta family, whom you say you have visited recurrently, which appoints board members of state-owned companies, influence the appointment of senior executive, determines how procurement should be handled and who should be recipient of such procurement. So amongst others, that is the, the context within which we are working at. So all the questions that we're going to deal with here are ultimately directed towards uh, finding certain in terms of what we're dealing with. So you were previously with PIC, so did you have any work in between PIC and Transnet? When I left uh, PIC, I um, had a, um, an agreement with Investec uh, where they uh, agreed to where we agreed to look for investments in property uh, with the Investec property division. Um, and um, so I was going to work, we were going to work together uh, to identify these uh, opportunities. But um, eventually um, uh, I decided that um, I would go to Transnet, and uh, uh, that is where I went. You decided that you are going to go to Transnet, or you were approached that you must go to Transnet. I decided to go to Transnet. Oh, oh, oh. There was a vacancy there, and then you applied for it. Yes, there was a vacancy for a chief executive officer. Okay, at what time did you meet with the members of the Gupta family? Uh, was it during that time of? working for Investec or after he had been employed in Transnet or for much earlier? Before, I have said that they had applied for funding at the PIC, which we declined. So I knew them by then. So of those Gupta members, who, who did you specifically had, had, had met before? AJ, Atul, or? Mr. AJ Gupta. Which one? AJ. AJ. Yeah. So that is the one that you had the relations with. So when you were working for Investec, was there a time where Fana Tlungwani came to you and said that they can find you a better job elsewhere than working for Investec in a small desk? No, no, no. You have never had any in, in interaction with Fana Tlungwani during that period? No, I met Fana Tlungwani at Norman Mashabani's funeral. Uh, we talked a little bit, that was it. And before you applied for the Transnet job, uh, did you ever meet with uh, Mr. Jacob Zuma in that, in that period there? No, I did not meet with Mr. Jacob Zuma. Did you meet with any members of the Gupta family or, or any of the following people, Salim Issa or Gary Peter or Nazim Hoa or Anod Singh, before you took the job in uh, Transnet? No. I actually have never met Mr. Salim Isa. Gary Peter, I met at uh, Transnet. I also met Anoch Singh at Transnet. So, so wh when, when did Anoch Singh uh, arrive in, uh, in Transnet? Before or after he had arrived there? At Transnet? Yes. Anoch Singh, I found him at uh, Transnet. You found him there? Yeah. There was a Mr. There was an acting Wells. Mr. Chris Wells was the CFO. 
And Gary Peter, you found him there as well. Yeah, Gary Peter was there as well. And have you ever met with Eric Wood? I think Eric Wood came to Transnet once, wanting to do a very, a, a hedge, or some kind of a transaction, a financial, very complicated transaction that even I found uh, I didn't understand. And I, I dismissed him and I said, no, I don't understand. Have you ever met with Nazim Hoa? Yes, Nazim was a, was at the new age. You met him when you went Transnet? When I was at Transnet. And then what was the context of the meeting? He was at the new age. They wanted sponsorship for the breakfasts. They wanted, um, uh, he called me about um, news related things for the new age at the time. And, and what ended up happening? Did you end up giving them any contract from Transnet? Yeah, the Transnet did sponsor the New Age breakfasts, but uh, yeah, we did sponsor the New Age, several of the New Age breakfasts. And then has Dudizani Zuma ever spoken to you about anything uh, when you were in Transnet, uh, or maybe later on when you were in ESCOM? No, we have never spoken about anything with uh, Mr. Duduzani Zuma. And but I have met him. We were at some birthday party of a one-year-old child and he came. And then when we were working in Transnet, how would you rate your performance there? You think that you had brought some degree of stability and proper governance in the executive when we were there. Or how would you rate your performance in Transnet? My performance was rated by the board. And, um, and what were the observations? I can't, I can't remember that the board had uh, issues of underperformance from myself. So everything else was fine there? Yes. And then who approached you to go to ESCOM? You decided as well that they're going to go to ESCOM. No, it was uh, Minister Brown who said, uh, look, we have very serious problems at ESCOM. Would you consider going there on an acting capacity? And then when, I said- When did it come to you to say that would uh, you I consider going the, to- I can't remember the exact date. I can't remember, but it's before I went to ESCOM. But we are aware who is leadership of ESCOM at the group uh, uh, chief executive level at that time when she approached you? Was I aware of? Who was leading ESCOM at that particular time? Yo, there were problems there. People were suspended and so on and so forth. I didn't know what was happening. So you don't remember that there was a person called Mr. Matuna who had just been appointed less than six months and had just been suspended as well. Former DG of public enterprises, which is a department which we are reporting to. We are just arrived there and then they say, new CEO of ESCOM, I'm sure you possibly knew about that because the former DG of public enterprises. And then Minister Brown comes to you and say that, would you consider acting in oh, ESCOM? Did you say Mr. Matuna had been suspended? Yeah, because uh, isn't it that you said that when they, they approached you, there was, some, there was a problem in ESCOM? Mr. Maduna was suspended. So you, you're not worried that, okay, here is the DG whom, as Transnet will report to, he was working as a DG of the Department of Public Enterprises within the, the, within the six months. He is now an executive in ESCOM. He is suspended, and now they're saying, I must go and take the responsibility. Didn't that raise some red flag around the, your, your thought process? Um, at about that time, I actually had gone to a bank during the day to do something at the bank. And I arrived at the bank, at the Standard Bank branch. And I found the manager at 11 o'clock during the day standing outside with his arms folded. And he said, you can't go into the bank because there's no electricity. At about that time, I remember being caught up in traffic in Santin. Santin, during load shedding in the evening, became pitch black, very dark. And it took hours to get from Santin to Irene, where I stay. 
and I was very angry as a South African that Santin has shut down. Santin needs candles. A branch of Standard Bank is not operating at 11 o'clock during the day because of load shedding. I was very angry. And um, when the minister said, would you go to ESCOM to help solve those problems? I said, yes, I will go and do my best. Do, do you know why I'm raising the issue of uh, Mr. Matuna is, is, is because when he came to give evidence here, he says that he was employed uh, as GCE, and then a new board was appointed, like new board members were added into ESCOM, and in a meeting which is supposed to be their induction, they suspended him without clear reason of why he's being suspended. And then he said that he didn't want to waste his money fighting against a huge state-owned company and going up and down and all of those things because he didn't have the deep pockets. And amidst that, you are then brought as a GCE. They didn't question what happened to the previous CEO. I want to have a handover process of what was happening uh, before because actually one of the things that Tsidiso Matuna says, or Mr. Matuna says, I don't know if that is the correct name, the first name. Uh, he says that Brian can claim that he brought stability to, to ESCOM because we were on our way to bringing stability and, and dealing with load shedding uh, long before he came there. Uh, well, I never engaged with Mr. Matuna on those matters, nor did I involve myself in uh, the issues uh, with Mr. Matuna. He was suspended and they asked me to be acting GCE. And I went there in an acting capacity. And while I was acting, uh, I don't know if he resigned or what happened, but he's, he, he left on a permanent basis. So that was it. And then after some time they said, would you consider being the actual um, uh, GCE? And I said, well, that is fine, uh, especially because we, I think at that point, we were working on something that I thought could help us with uh, resolving the problem of load shedding because it was about plant availability. Um, I said today that I did not resolve the problem of load shedding and I mentioned young engineers who came up with the idea of Tetris that helped us resolve the problem of load shedding. So, I, mean, I, like, I, so I did not claim that I resolved load shedding. Is, is that how you arrived in, in Trustnet as well, where you just arrive in a huge state-owned corporation like ESCOM and you do not even care to take uh, information from your predecessor? Is that how you arrived and you, you didn't even get to know what was happening, what are developments? You just I hit the ground running and, and focused on the on the way forward. Yeah, I think this thing of handover is overrated. I've said that before. Um, the best way to appraise the situation is without the baggage of what had been happening in the past. And to get in there objectively, listen to everybody, listen, make an appreciation of the situation on your own without without being bombarded by um, the uh, perceptions or the problems of the past. So generally, um, incidentally, uh, Mr. Shivambu, when I went to the PIC, there was no handover. When I went to Transnet, there was no handover. When I went to ESCOM, there was no handover. And um, I would not classify any of those assignments as uh, failures. And then the, the process of the request for proposals and the request for information which uh, ESCOM issued uh, concerning the nuclear build program, did it happen when you were in ESCOM? How did that come about? Where was that decision taken uh, that ESCOM was going to procure uh, nuclear? It was a cabinet decision. It was a cabinet decision that you must start the RFP and RFI process for the procurement of nuclear? Yeah, I think there was a cabinet subcommittee and then a cabinet decision. And then you, you, you said perhaps uh, elsewhere that you went to familiarize yourself 
uh, with how nuclear energy functions. When did you do that and where? I did it in the course of uh, 2016 at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. There is a course on uh, a nuclear reactor course, uh, a nuclear reactor technology. Uh, I did that course at uh, MIT. I thought I gave you a crash course on that at some point. Uh, the, uh, do you know? Do you know the uh, the time where the Oak Bay bought the uranium mine? Was it not around the same period? No. When, when, when was they it? Bought the uranium mine when I was at the PIC. But the major investments of the Shiva arrangements and all of those didn't it what happen Shiva when, when I was at the PIC. And then the listing, when did it happen? Didn't it happen uh, during the period that you were in ESCOM? I can't remember. I never followed that properly. And how then do you respond to a, a view that the whole rush to utilizing nuclear as another source of energy was linked, one, to Gupta's interest, two, to the fact that senior government officials took a bribe from the Russians uh, in order to implement a, a nuclear energy problem, a, a program, I meant to say. I don't know anything about those allegations, but from what I know, from a technical point of view, and what I know about Quebec, uh, is that Quebec is currently giving us the cheapest source of electricity. The problem with nuclear is that the upfront costs are very high, but the life of a nuclear plant is about 80 years with very cheap electricity. The, issue are the, the issues are the safety issues which can be managed, that have been managed. The United States has 99 nuclear reactors all over the United States. France gets over 70% of its electricity from nuclear. The Chinese are doing it. The Chinese are building nuclear reactors. I do not understand why we in Africa who do not have electricity are afraid of nuclear or we are being made to fear nuclear. From a technical point of view, without bringing in the politics and the Russians and so on and so forth, if we just look at the matter objectively and remove, uh, for example, if you say let's procure nuclear from a country that is competent to provide us with, uh, with uh, nuclear uh, reactors, um, uh, without naming what the country is, um, would you take, would you arrive at the same conclusion? I think people have... Uh, a fear of Russia that I don't understand. Uh, but I don't mind, we can obtain it from the United States or from China or from uh, the Japanese uh, who are very competent. The thing is we have to get, or the French even, uh, the thing is we have to get technology that is compatible with uh, what we already have here and what we already know, which is, uh, um, yeah. What, what, what by about, the way, what, what, what about the, the by the way, what about the, the concern that the present fiscal capacity can accommodate uh, a, a usually expensive nuclear build program? Isn't that a genuine concern? I have said that it is possible to fund this thing without touching the fiscus. Uh, what you do is uh, you ring fence future revenue from uh, the nuclear plants and uh, raise capital against that. Uh, that was my view anyway. And in fact, at the time when the public protector's report came out and I decided to take early retirement, uh, we had been working on possible financial models to do that. Uh, so it's objective. I mean, if people want to criticize that you can't do that, it must be on, um, um, uh, technical, on a technical basis, not uh, that uh, the Russians did that minister signed a contract and so on and so forth. What, 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 what do you mean? I mean, I'm saying that we must not care about the 
fiscal complica the, uh, complications and, uh, uh, and, and consequences of nuclear, we must just look at the technical issues, narrowly like that. Is that what you're saying? No, but we're going to the other extreme here. We're forgetting the technical issues completely. Then, then you, your, your justification of the together deal is uh, optimum coal had already given or had already sold the coal to together and that prepayments are standard in ESCOM. You then give the prepayment to together so that they could give you the coal and they ultimately delivered the coal and then through an arbitration process the 2.1 billion which OCH was owing to ESCOM was later on reduced to about 600 million. Why is it that that prepayment that you gave to Tegeta was exactly the same amount which Tegeta needed to purchase uh, optimum coal holdings or mine? It wasn't. If you look at uh, P.S. Marsden's testimony, he says they were short of 600 million. And how much did you pay? Uh, we bought coal for 586. I think we must revisit those figures there because the figures that were given here point to the fact that the exact amount that was needed to conclude the deal is what ESCOM ultimately paid. In a, in a meeting which was called midnight, a, just the day before the deal could expire or the deal could flop. Uh, yeah. How do you explain that? Don't yeah. you think that you were being utilized as a vehicle, as a means to close a deal for a, yeah, a Gupta firstly, and Duduzane Zuma's owned company? Yeah. Firstly, I have said I had not been at that meeting. I was not at that meeting uh, on the 11th, uh, firstly. But secondly, uh, in understanding the transaction, because I did get to understand it, uh, uh, P.S. Marsden's thing talks about 600 million that he even tried to go and borrow from the banks and they refused to give it to him. It was 600 million. The deal was 586 million to provide coal for three months, May, June, and July. The coal was provided. Now, the cost of load shedding, which is the cost of not having, if we had not had the coal, for example, for one reason or another, and we were running short of supplies of coal during winter. Uh, I heard today uh, Veneta Lane saying it is um, 450 million rand a day, a day. If we can avoid load shading by doing a prepayment and buying coal, prepaying coal and making sure that we have coal, if we had not done it, you would be asking us today, Mr. Shibambo, why didn't you do that deal? so that you can avoid load shedding. And then what, what is it, can you please just take us through the process that uh, reduced the amount which Optimum Coal was owing has come from 2.1 billion to 600 million. What exactly happened? That was after I had left, but my understanding is that uh, the matter went for arbitration, which... So the person who did that was uh, Machela Kuku? was the acting CEO. Yeah, and the CFO. They will come here and, and not you can ask them what, yeah, because it was okay, actually no, that's fine. Yeah, we, apparently we, very, very technical. And then the McKinsey Trillion uh, Consulting Services, did it happen when you were in ESCO? The consulting services happened. I'm speaking about this specific one which, which ended up with the the 1.5 billion yeah, rand payment. The payments Did it made, happen when you were in ESCOM? The payments were made during this year. Yeah? This year. I but left. the whole consulting services happened I when you were still in the ESCOM. There was a, a, an agreement with McKenzie and that they would subcontract to Trillion. The question was, was there an agreement to subcontract? the subcontracting agreement. There are different versions of what happened there, and I'm sure that uh, when uh, Mr. Singh comes here, he will be able to explain. But it involved getting permission from the Treasury to get the subcontracting agreement to be done. Now, there's a difference of opinion as to whether that permission was granted or not. But I'm not 
that can be shed light on by uh, Mr. Singh and uh, yeah, I think Mr. Koko. In, yeah, we'll deal with it there. The, uh, you say that uh, you, are, you have not subjected the state of capture report of the public protector to a judicial review because of a, a legal advice. What legal advice is that? Because yes. you, you I'm, I'm saying this because in your official submission, you are trying to turn upside down the observations or notes, whatever you call them, of the public protector. Uh, you, you, go, you go into town saying that, no, the phones are not nine way. Actually, this number and all of those things there. What kind of legal advice is that you should not do a judicial review? What does it say? It says the report had no findings. So if the report has no findings, there's nothing to review. But even if it doesn't have uh, findings, Colonel uh, Mulif, the, the observations, its status is that it has got a local stand, it has got a legal standing as a perspective. And your, your counting, your countenance to what is contained in the public protector report means absolutely nothing because See, you, are not, you, are, you, are, you are not authority, you are not law, and the Public Protector's Office, as has been confirmed by the Constitutional Court, is authority that is established by the Constitution. Senior counsel disagrees with you, and I'm not the lawyer, I take legal advice. But, but isn't that pretty obvious that, that uh, a report of the Public Protector which has got a legal standing, which is established by the Constitution, which is established additionally by the Public Protector Act, make certain observations about your movements, about your conduct, and everything else, and then you fold your arms and say, no, I'm not going to say anything, but when you come here, you want us to listen to you, and you want us to believe what you are saying against a, a legal document that is a product of investigation by the Office of the Public Protector. How, 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 how should we relate to your information vis-a-vis -vis the Public Protector's information? Well, counsel says the Constitutional Court has said findings. Well, what is the name of the counsel? Uh, what Graves. is his name? Mr. Graves. Oh, Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, Matun. Okay. What does he say? He says the Constitutional Court has said findings are binding. I don't know what that means. So. It is a matter that has been ventilated about there has to be findings. And my reading of it is that until there are findings, it's just fresh air. Do you know, do you know uh, the uh, findings, right, and a remedial action are a product of investigation in terms of what the public protector would otherwise do? You can't say that in a public protector report, the only thing that is binding is the tail end and what have been the observations, the building blocks towards the finding do not matter. Like, let's give an example with Nkanda. There's certain findings which are possibly one page. And those findings are a product of the events that happened with Minente, the architect, which happened with the officials in the public works department and all of those things there. Those are the building blocks to the ultimate end. And then the findings are the ones that then say that this is what we think should be remedial action. Isn't that basic logic, uh, Colonel? Well, Mr. Um, Shivam, that was the legal advice that I got. And I am not competent in that area. And so maybe I will live to regret it one day. Uh, that uh, let's yeah let's let's let's, so, let's, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. I think that is what we w will be the attitude of. Uh, I think that should be the attitude of the, the committee as well. That unless the observations and the notes and the building blocks of the public protector have been. Uh, reviewed in a judicial process. We're going to take them as fact, as final. We can't, because you are not authority of law, we can't say that uh, uh, Colonel uh, Brian Mulefe has uh, 
given us an alternate vision and then we're going to compare that against the public protector which is a constitutional establishment and then we we are not sure we would want to believe we have got no choice as parliament we have to take the part of the public protector is that a sensible approach no <laughs> why not it just isn't a sensible approach like, how, how, are you saying that I have said, Mr. Shivambo, that uh, are, are you saying, are you saying that this have, like compared to your your information, your note here, we must believe you instead of the public protector. <laughs> Is that what you are saying we should do? I have given you the answer that there was nothing to review. There were no findings. That no, is but what I'm the saying say. in terms of the if observations that are there, because the, the public protector says that I, I have you have received 45 calls from Ajay Gupta, you have been very close to Ajay okay. Gupta, which is a okay. solid observation. Mr. Who do we believe now in terms of the legal standing? The, your lawyer is there, can whisper to you again. Who do we believe between you and the public protector? Mr. Shivambo, can you tell me the phone calls from Mr. Ajay Gupta? One phone call from which number? When? But the public protector has dealt with that. I'm not no, investigating the issue. She hasn't. But it's there in the public it's protector's not there. report. She just says there were phone calls. She doesn't say when and how, from which number. But it, it's, it has got legal standing. It's, it has got weight no, because it, it comes from public standing. protector. My legal advice is that it does not have legal standing. Just because you want it to have legal standing does not mean it has legal standing, Mr. Shivam. I know you're a very powerful man from the EFF. But just because you have a desire for it to have legal standing <laughs> does not automatically make it to have legal standing. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Do, do, you, know, do you know, Mr. Mulefe, uh, if I don't know what is the tragedy now because your lawyer is sitting next to you and he is misleading you in, in a profound and spectacular way, right? Do you rather you were because my lawyer? The, 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 uh, so it's, it's just basic logic. Let us, let's live, let's, let's, let's... But Mr. Shivambu, yes. I will choose him as a lawyer than you. Or, or you can choose a constitutional structure which is established no, by the Constitution. I will not choose Ms. Matunsela Or you can choose the lawyer. constitutional court's interpretation of public protector reports. No, Mr. No. Which say that the reports of the public protector are binding unless subject to judicial review. There's no finding. What... Like the context is that the findings are a product of a process of investigation and observations. That process was not finished, Mr. Shivambo. The public protector says these matters must be investigated further. That process was not finished. She was in a hurry to finish this report. It was not finished properly. I don't understand why. She did not allow the new public protector to finish the investigation. She was in too much of a hurry to call it the final report. No, not that's fine. I think we'll deal with that at, the, at a different level. The last question is, what is the definition of retirement? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm exiting now. What is the definition of retirement? Or, or you can ask I the lawyer again. No, I can Google it. OK, yeah, 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 please do. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Shivamu. Let me look for it, and then I'll come back to you. On it. No, no, please, 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 because there's a clear context which you want to deal with. What is retirement? Because my, my reading of retirement is that when you leave employment permanently, in a public statement that you issued, you said that I'm leaving ESCOM. I'm exploring what next step to take. And uh, less than four months later, you are sworn in as a member of parliament, which is the next step, which nullifies the notion of a big debt letter that you are retired from ESCO. Isn't that the case? Yeah, the retirement has the effect that uh, you have left. Oh, so, so if, you, if you leave employment as a retirement, is that your, your definition? No, you can resign, you can retire, you can... Uh, but I'm, I'm asking about the retirement, your understanding of retirement. Are you saying that if I leave parliament and decide to be full-time international relations officer in the head office of the EFF tomorrow, I'll say I've retired. 
even when I'm in, in the immediate aftermath of my retirement, and then I say I'm retiring, and then I'm, is that Mr. the Mr. If you write a letter to Parliament, yes. and ask to retire, and Parliament says, we have approved your application to retire, then you are retired. Isn't that simplistic, uh, Kenya? Things don't need to be complicated, <laughs> Mr. Shwambo. You don't have to complicate everything. <laughs> Do, do, you know, do you know that we will deal with the merits and, and, and assessment of your submissions, but the fact of the matter, Chair, is that uh, Mr. Brian Mulliver did not retire from ESCOM. He resigned and he publicly communicated that it was accepted by the board and by the minister, and when the narrative of his pension fund could not be fit properly by his resignation. He then claimed that he has resigned and then big dated a letter uh, of retirement to Mr. Ben Gobane who by all means and, and purposes is not a credible human being. But we'll deal with that when we come to assessment and recommendations of what should uh, happen with the whole uh, information that is being provided here. Chair, I think that it is unfortunate that what Mr. Shivambo is trying to do is to um, force feed the findings of this uh, uh, August uh, uh, committee in its work. I think, Mr. Shivambo, today we made the presentation, the questions were asked. That comment must be reserved for when you want to make the findings. Uh, I think it is a bit premature for you to be jumping to conclusions at this early stage. Thank you very much. That was the last response. And uh, Honorable Shivambu, you have exceeded Honorable Mazzoni's record. I'm recording all the minutes yeah, today, now, this, uh, this evening. Uh, yeah. Can we, if we, Honorable Members, Honorable Members, I will, I will, will, will get a comfortable break, but before that, we have uh, uh, negotiated with the next witness. He has agreed to come back tomorrow. So, the, the, and uh, I, I appreciate it very much that he, he, he has stayed here for this long and is still cooperating with us to come back tomorrow. tomorrow. I value that, sir. Thank you very much. And members uh, will fit him in tomorrow's uh, uh, program. Uh, advocate, is that okay with you? That's an order, ma'am. I'm a bit tired myself. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Can you, how many minutes, members, do you require? Okay. Can can we have 5 minutes break? Thank you. Thanks.